Loves the time. Get it. I'm supposed to be, but is Ron getting on or no? It is? Oh, right. Why is my mic Right, but I did want Ron to give an update. Yeah, you have me. I don't see him. I'm on, Madam Chair. Oh, you're there. Okay, can you give us an update? We don't have a quorum. Um, hope you want to hear all about what, what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board Members, uh, Committee Members. Just really quick. Um, we're on day 53 of session. A lot's happened since the last time I updated you a couple of weeks ago with the, with the joint committee meeting. Um, let me start with our appropriations. Um, we were not in the initial House and Senate budget as we reported to you. Um, President Simpson's office reached out and they did a floor amendment to get us into the, to the final Senate budget. Um, as was being passed off the Senate floor, which put us in play to, in conference. The conference process started last week here in Tallahassee, started a little bit early. We, um, over the weekend, the good news is they closed out in one of the first passes of the TED appropriations um, conference process, they closed out the 1.5 million. So the House went to the Senate position of 1.5. Um, it is non-recurring transportation trust fund dollars, which as no is not ideal for some of our partners, but that's where they funded it from this point. They have not backfilled with federal dollars yet, so we're not sure how the federal dollars may come into play. There's a number of projects they funded with non-recurring transportation trust fund dollars. Um, we're not sure if those have an opportunity to get funded with some of the federal dollars at some point, but as of right now, a number of projects, including ours, was filled back with um, backfilled with non-recurring transportation trust fund dollars. Um, nothing's official until the budget process is done. I would tell you they're about halfway through the budget process at this point. A lot still has to happen over the next four or five days up here to get the budget in a position to be done um, on members' desk by Tuesday for they can vote on it for Friday. As you all know, we're scheduled to be done on April the 30th, so we're on track to be done on April the 30th, but. Again, they've got a little bit of work on the budget. Um, we'll need to work on a veto strategy. Um, you know, last year we were vetoed. Um, it wasn't necessarily, I don't think as much to do with, um, you know, their support of our project as much as it was, um, you know, at that point um, they, 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 they vetoed a number of projects plus the fact we just received um, a pretty large um, uh, appropriation from the federal government through the CARES Act. Um, I've made it very clear to uh, the House and Senate, as well as the governor's office, the federal dollars that are coming down today, we're not going to receive any of those. So these state dollars are very important to T-BARD, and I think they've, um, they've got that message. So um, again, it's in the House and Senate budget. Um, when it's closed out and 72 hours starts, you know, um, you know, at that point ticking, I'll be really excited to make sure at that point, once we're in, that we can start working on a veto strategy with the um, with the governor's office. Let me talk briefly about our um, our, our bill um, that was changing our enabling act, um, which you all um, voted and in, in, in encouraged me to go off and do in Tallahassee. 
um, I'm happy to report to you that we're able to actually get our language. The Mariano bill was included in the House Transportation DOT package, um, which is actually up today in the House on the special order calendar. Yesterday, um, Senator Hooper, who has the companion to that bill, included our language on the floor by an amendment by Senator Roussan. So our language right now is in play in the House and Senate in the DOT packages. Um, for those of you that have been doing this for a while, as you all know, DOT, the DOT package, um, number one, it's a list of priorities that DOT has. Then it comes up with a number of other transportation related issues the House and Senate want to include that are germane to transportation. Um, the good news is with us being in the House in Senate bills at this point, I think there's a really good opportunity for us to be included in, in the final package. I will tell you, some of you may have seen today in the media, um, Senator Brandon just did try to include yesterday the amendment to repeal us on the DOT package as well. Um, he ended up with, withdrawing the amendment, but he did make some comments as we, we expected he would with regards to why he does not support t barda or duplication of services and that um, he doesn't believe that um, t barda needs to um, need to be in existence because all the things that we do can be done by PSTA, heart, local governments, all the things we've heard, you know, meeting with him um, earlier this year. He ended up withdrawing the amendment, but he did, um, he did say a few things that um, showed up in a few articles this morning that we've shared with David, David this morning. So the good news, Madam Chair, where we are today is the 1.5 million um, is in the House and Senate budget, it's been closed out. And number two, our language for our, our, our bill at this point um, is included in both the House and Senate DOT packages. So I'm happy to answer any questions or comments. Two people we need to thank, by the way, during all of this. Um, um, Cliff on our board has been absolutely fantastic. Um, he's been in constant communication with the Senate President's office. Um, he's been incredibly helpful, um, not only in our preparation, but yesterday, for example, there was another amendment that was filed on the DOT bill by Senator Brandis that uh, we just want to make sure it didn't have some impact on us. And I know he had been reached out to by the Senate president's office. And so I um, appreciate Cliff doing that. President Simpson, we're not, in the, we're not in the House and Senate budget without President Simpson at this point. And then Representative Angolia over in the House was the one that was helped make, make happen us getting our language, um, our enabling act language into the DOT package. So I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the members? I think Commissioner Starkey. Yeah, I didn't hear where or didn't understand it, where he said Jeff Brandis's comments were today. Now, it. what was that last part you said about Senator Brandis? He put an amendment on there. He tried to put it. He's tried to put an amendment on. Uh, it was pretty technical relating to commercial vehicles. We weren't sure what the impact could be. Um, the, the amendment ended up being withdrawn, but the Senate President's office had shared it with us just to make sure. There wasn't going to be a potential impact on T-BARDA or actually PSK or HARP for that matter because um, it was pretty technical and it could have, could have had an impact on us. We're not. The, the amendment was withdrawn. The the amendment the, the language actually is in the House DOT bill at this point. We're actually working with Representative Magoli to see what the, what the purpose of that language is. Okay, Catherine. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I just and I, I was trying to find where those comments were published. I, I did a Google search, it didn't come up, but- It's in Florida politics, um, Commissioner. We'll send, I'll text it to you. Okay, I might get that. Anyone else? Thank you. No? Good report, Ron, carry on. Try to keep them from doing any more damage to local governments, would you please? Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Can't be over soon enough. They've done enough mischief. <laughs> All right, is Ben Skoyak on today, Jennifer? Yes, Madam Chair, it's Harry, I'm, I am oh, here. Oh, Harry, I, I can't see you. Usually we see everybody, but you're not on the screen. Now you're on the screen. There you go. Is Steve with us? He's, he's actually has a doctor's appointment. He'll, I think he's gonna be on for the board meeting, monitoring the board meeting, but I've got it this morning. Okay, well. Uh, Go forth and give us your report then. Sure. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we haven't seen you for a, a couple of weeks, so uh, quite a bit's been happening. I uh, want to give you an update on where we are with the current infrastructure negotiations, discussions. Uh, a couple nominations uh, have been moving through the Senate uh, that are of interest. Uh, the administration put out a major discretionary grant opportunity for transportation. We'll talk about that. And then 
the president's budget is starting to come out. So we can talk about that. Obviously, the, the front and center, I think, for of interest to you is the co continuing negotiations between Congress and the, and the White House and Republicans and Democrats on this major infrastructure legislation. As you know, at the end of March, the president released a $2.25 trillion infrastructure package uh, focused on a variety of uh, infrastructure initiatives, including highways, bridges, um, and transit. Um, he would pay for that. It, it's an eight year package. We, money would be released, spent over eight years, and it would be financed by an increase in the uh, federal corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. The Republicans yesterday uh, released their version of, uh, well, let me start back up by saying the president's been trying to encourage Republicans to engage, to try and make this a bipartisan package. Uh, Republicans have been discussing something in the neighborhood of a 600 to $800 billion alternative package, much smaller than the president's. Yesterday, they uh, released a um, uh, $568 billion package. I put this up on the screen. I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, if you can see it, it, this is kind of a comparison of the Republican plan versus what the president proposed. And you'll see uh, Republicans proposed a significantly uh, bigger allotment for roads and bridges, 299 billion versus 115 billion, and a significantly smaller amount of money for transit, 61 billion versus 85 billion in the president's plan. So, you know, that there's, there's quite a bit of difference there. Um, I think uh, the president, I think, was hoping the Republicans were going to come in a little bit closer to his number. Um, I think they're a little bit underwhelmed on the Republican or on the Democrat side at the White House on this. So I'm not sure where this leaves the discussions. The Republican bill is a five-year bill instead of an eight-year bill. So that's why the numbers are a little smaller. And it does uh, attempt to pay for it without raising taxes, but by increasing right. fees on airport passengers, uh, port fees. And they actually discuss for the first time using a fee it would be derived from vehicle driven miles to try and capture uh, the impact of electric vehicles. So that's something new. Neither the Republican nor the Democrat plan uh, addresses the issue of the get, raising the gas tax. They both stay away from that. So there's significant differences between the plans. The House still intends to mark up its version of the bill, which would be closer to $2 trillion in May. The Speaker has said she wants a bill through the House, if possible, by the 4th of July. Um, the president wants a bill on his desk before Labor Day, so they've got a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, and they're still trying to figure out if they're going to use an expedited process that would um, that would push this bill through the Senate on pretty much a, a Democrat party line vote. It's a the, what they call the budget reconciliation process is what they use for the COVID relief package in February. So a lot of work to be done, um, but either way, in either package, I think, and we'll talk a little bit more about the budget. There's will be significant opportunities if, if and when the infrastructure bill becomes law for transit programs like those that you're interested in. Second thing I want to talk about is since we last met, I think just before the last meeting, uh, the Secretary of Transportation had been confirmed. Since then, uh, we had told you about Polly Trottenberg was the president's nominee to be the Deputy Secretary of Transportation. She's a, 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 an old hand at transportation issues, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation and served in a senior level position under President Obama. She was confirmed last month, so that's that's good news for leadership at the DOT. Nuria Fernandez, who uh, Madam Chair, we've talked about before, um, has been nominated now to be administrator of the FTA, although not confirmed. Uh, she continues to serve in a deputy position at the DOT while awaiting her confirmation. She'll be a, a great uh, FTA administrator. She is the general manager of the Santa Clara uh, Valley Transportation Authority in California. So she knows that well. She served in senior positions at the New York MTA, the Chicago uh, Transit Authority, and the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority. And she was a, uh, an acting administrator of the FTA under the Clinton administration. So she, she's good experience, and I think she will be uh, good to work with. Uh, third item I want to talk about just briefly because it does give sort of a, a look into the thinking of the current administration. Uh, just the other day, the, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a notice of funding opportunity for what they're calling now the RAISE grant program. The RAISE grant stands for the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity program. This is a discretionary grant program of, of $1 billion that um, 
is available for regional uh, pro transportation projects of regional significance. It's a highly competitive program. Hillsborough County actually received two grants last year under this program. It was in the previous administration called the Build Grant Program. And under the Obama administration it was called the Tiger Grant Program. But just to give you an idea of the competitive nature, they've awarded $9 billion in grants in the program's 10 year history. And that's 680 projects out of 9,700 applications. So the success rate for this program is only 7%, but it is a good opportunity for um, uh, large regionally significant transportation projects and something worth uh, T-Bar to looking at down in going forward in the future. One of the reasons we wanted to point this out to you is it does give us a look inside this administration. According to the notice of funding opportunity, the RAISE funding program is going to evaluate projects based on safety, environmental sustainability, quality of life, economic competitiveness, state of good repair, innovation, and partnerships. But most importantly, they add these criteria. The department will prioritize projects, projects that demonstrate improvements to racial equity, reduce impacts of climate change, and create good paying jobs. So, you know, that, that's kind of the focus for all of the discretionary programs throughout the, the new administration are those particularly equity and climate change issues. And so, you know, as we look, work together and look forward to potential funding in future cycles, um, we need to keep those things in mind. Finally, um, the president on April 9th released what they call the skinny version of his budget, which is kind of a broad overview of his budget. More details are to be released in May. But there was some good news in there for transportation. Uh, the president's uh, fiscal year 22 budget request will include $25.6 billion for federal transportation programs. Uh, with, and that includes a $3.2 billion increase or about 14% increase in transportation discretionary programs, which are really important to transit agencies. And among his highlights that he talked about in his budget release was um, expanding access to high quality transit, he said his discretionary request includes $2.5 billion for the Capital Investment Grant Program. And I'm sure you know that's where we funded the uh, Sunrunner Program for PSTA. So that's a 23% increase over the current year. So clearly it'll be a lot more headroom for Capital Investment Grant Programs going forward. Uh, the president says these projects would help communities better link workers to job centers, reduce highway congestion and shorten commute times. So I know those are all goals of T-BARTA. Secondly, his budget request provides $250 million for grants to transit agencies to purchase low and no emission buses. This doubles, more than doubles the current funding level in the current year. So this expands, I saw HART is moving towards electric buses, PSTAs very aggressively moving towards electric buses. So that's uh, good news for transit agencies in the area. Third, the uh, program establishes a new program called the Thriving Communities Initiative Pilot which will be a $110 million program to provide technical assistance to communities to improve access to destinations and foster community vibrancy. So it's a new program to, to try and link uh, transportation alternatives to help move, get people to work at the school and to doctor's appointments and other things. And then finally, there's a new program that the president has been talking about in several of his speeches. It's a $20 billion fund to help communities that have been isolated or damaged by previous highway or transportation projects. He specifically talked about uh, interstate projects in New Orleans and Syracuse, New York, that divided some African-American communities, and they had to, to raise a number of homes and businesses to build those roads. So this is, a, this is a pot of money that will be available to communities. You know, you think of areas in Tampa, like Seminole Heights, or where I-275 goes through, and communities were divided by major projects. They're trying to find ways to bring those communities back together with this fund. So also something to look at for communities in Pinellas and Hillsborough County that have been impacted by major highway projects. So this, this, this budget release kicks off the federal appropriations process. It's about three months late in starting. So it's gonna be a pretty aggressive cycle. Uh, the house leadership is, has pledged to get all the house bills done. It's gonna be a tall task by uh, the 4th of July. And they hope to have some of the bills signed into law before October 1st. We'll see how that goes. But, been a pretty busy uh, couple of weeks on the transportation front. And we're happy to answer any questions. Questions? None? No questions. Okay. So 
So we had Bill, we had Tiger. What did you say Biden's name is going to be? It's called RAISE, R-A-I-S-E, the RAISE grant program. The maximum okay. award will be $25 million in states. No state can receive more than $100 million in RAISE grant fundings, but 50% of the money is divided between urban and rural projects. It's a billion dollar pot of funding total. So does our project meet qualifications to apply for that? Our BRT? Um, probably they're looking for projects that are ready to go to construction. So I think, um, I think you're a little bit I think more design would have to be, and engineering would have to be done before you'd be ready to apply for this, this in this cycle anyway. Well, what's the, fund, what's the funding deadlines in order to apply, Harry? So this, this the, the deadline is uh, July, I believe the 12th is the current deadline for this cycle. There's an annual cycle once a year, the notice comes out in, in spring with the deadline for application during the summer. So I. I'm not sure you're gonna be ready to go by July 12th. Well, I have some ideas. We're gonna talk about it at the board me meeting and maybe by then we'll be in a position, David, to move forward. What do you think? As long as we don't skip any more meetings. We, we still need to complete the PD&E. We still <laughs> need to work on the, the design and engineering of whatever the project is that you all would like to move forward. This money can't be used for PDE and design. It has to be construction. That's correct. So that means that you have to have consensus and it has to move forward to a certain. And, and keep state. in mind, our project is aligned with TV Next. So we can't build anything until they build the, the roadway. So we, we're, our timeline is in line with their timeline. Madam Chair, it also requires NEPA and other other um, reviews to be complete too. So I think you know, there's quite a bit of work to be done to get ready for an application. Well, this is only year one. So we can see if we can gather goal to be in for year two. I was going to suggest, I mean, this is it's not like a good program. That is one of our entries for Absolutely. Didn't Hillsborough get a build grant to do uh, the sidewalk on the other side of the river? Was that a build grant? Um, the walkway along the river. They got a lot of money. They Are did. Too well. Bring it to Hillsborough County. I don't know if you can expand on those two. Harry. I'm sorry. I could. I, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear that. What they're talking about the sidewalk expansion on the Hillsborough River and wanting to know, did, the, did they get two grants, one grant? What did they get? There Do were two know? grants last year. There was a grant for work on I-75 on the east side of Hillsborough County it was a build grant. And then I believe there was some money last year for uh, downtown and, and the Riverwalk area, yes. Yeah, on that side of the river. Okay. Kevin, so Chris. Chris. Uh, Secretary Gwynn would like recognized. Oh, Secretary Gwynn, good morning. Thank you for being with us. I don't know why we can't see. I wish we could see all the faces. I don't know why. I don't know where yeah. Blue went, but usually. Make that adjustment mid-meeting. We'll make that change. Okay. Well, just I just wanted to real quick, and I think um, you just got part of the answer, but last year there were two bill grants in Hillsborough County, one for the Big Bend Road I-75 interchange and one for a number of bicycle and pedestrian improvements throughout uh, the Riverwalk area. Um, FDOT is submitting three grants this year. Um, and right now it looks like one of them is gonna be for some improvements in the um, Heights area that would help support um, the uh, arterial BRT project that Hart is studying from USF down to downtown and also the uh, streetcar modernization and extension. So that's one of the ones that we're gonna be pursuing this year. Okay, yeah. Did you say you're studying, that you're putting in for money on when you're studying in the Heights? So um, in order to build the project, um, 
the streetcar extension as well as the uh, arterial bus rapid transit system, there needs to be some other infrastructure improvements made, particularly related to some drainage problems that are, are in that area. Some of the drainage system needs to be upgraded. We need to do some other work, uh, more or less to prepare for that those projects to be able to come in and, and be built behind it. And so it's not specifically for the transit uh, projects themselves, but it's for some of the infrastructure improvements that have to be made to accommodate those uh, in the future. But are you shovel ready? Or is your PD&E done and all that kind of stuff? We've got a lot of that already done. Yeah, we've been working with um, with Hillsborough MPO, with the city, uh, with Hart on uh, these projects. So they're in a variety of different stages right now, but yeah, they've all been initiated and we've got some of our funding in there in future years for this already. Okay. So this conversation brings me to around to the importance of all of our transit agencies working together and forming some kind of a collaborative effort because I know that PSTA is going to or has already applied for some of the RAISE grant funding, Harry. I think you might be aware of that for the Clearwater sure. Transit Center. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Yeah. So I, I think those kind of that piece of information is really important as we devise our priorities so that there's strength in numbers and we can speak once again with one message and one voice about how important the Tampa Bay area is. Hey, hey Madam Chair, it's Harry. Um, just uh, following the Secretary Gwynn's comments, I, I wanna compliment the state DOT. They have really uh, become much more aggressive this year in working across the entire state to track what communities are doing in applying for federal grants and to provide whatever support they can to local applicants. And so they, they have been I know generating letters of support for projects and coordinating with, uh, I know they've been coordinating with PSTA on the Clearwater Transit Center grant. So I just wanna compliment the state DOT. They're really making a concerted effort this year to, to coordinate what's going on throughout the entire state when it comes to federal uh, grant writing activities. So I, don't you think it would be important for Forward Pinellas to be involved in some of those discussions as well, Harry, since they set up the agenda pretty much for the whole entire Pinellas, Pasco, Hillsborough area. It, it and does. And I, and I think, I'm sure on, the, on these programs too, the, the RAISE grant particularly, it, they're really looking to show, to see signs of regional support for signals of regional support for these projects. They want letters of support from local transportation providers, chambers of commerce and other things. So that's one of the key criteria is that, that these projects are are supported regionally and not just on a, on a very local basis and that they'll have a regional impact. So that, I think that's why the state's involvement is, is helpful here too. Good discussion, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Harry, good to see you. Uh, one question I had is the, cur the current raise grant and going forward too with additional legislation, I had heard some talk of actually raising the federal grant uh, contribution. Can you elaborate on that? Is that a possibility? Because uh, I know, fed, you know, ma matching dollars before have had significant matching requirements for local state government. If the feds raise the ante there and pay for more, I mean, it might be more of an opportunity for Gibarda as well as some of the other participating agencies to, to make deals more palatable. You're talking about the, making the local match larger for federal, for these federal grants? Oh, making, making the federal grant larger. Oh, yeah. Well, they're, they're, they can go up to 80% federal and 20% local. Under the previous administration, they were they were really looking for projects that would lower. They didn't, Congress kind of rebuffed them a little bit on that, the previous administration, because they were trying to encourage uh, applicants to reduce the match and make it more of a 50-50 proposition rather than 80-20. Uh, Congress has kind of rebuffed them on that, saying the law statute says 80-20. And, um, and so I think the current administration is, is trying to keep it at the higher federal match and the lower local match. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind here is as they're doing infrastructure uh, bills. And you know, at the end of the day, they could increase the amount of money that's available for the bill grant program going in future years. So it's been currently funded at about a billion dollars a year. You know, if, 
certainly if they increase the pot of money available, say next year, that obviously op opens more opportunities for more projects to be funded. So that's something else we'll continue to watch for you. Thank you. Okay. Well, Commissioner uh, McLean has a comment or question. Yeah, uh, more of a question, um, and, and it might be a naive question, but probably more focused to Secretary Gwynn. Um, Secretary Gwynn, you mentioned projects in, in both Pinellas and Hillsboro. Um, as the regional agency here, is there a way to get a, a, a better view of um, all those projects that are going on within the region so that we as a agency know about them and, and can at least speak to them? To some degree, um, and, and so what I'm what I'm really getting at is is maybe either a monthly or, or a quarterly update on grants uh, that are either be being applied for or have been awarded um, throughout the region. Again, so we and, and again, I might be asking a naive question, Commissioner Long. You might have this already, but it'd be nice to have something like that. So we, as the regional organization, would would to kind of see that and understand what's going on in the region. So to, to Commissioner McLean's point, Mr. Secretary, this brings me back to the conversation we had down in Manatee County almost two years ago now about doing a regional transportation summit. Maybe it's time for us to re-energize that conversation and put that together sooner rather than later because between Hillsborough and Pinellas, and I'm not sure about Pasco, but I know there's an awful lot going on with regard to transportation funding, our own transportation trust funds. How do we replenish the gap in the gas tax that we currently are recognizing as a result of cars not being on the road last year? So what do you think? Can, can, and going back to Commissioner McLean's uh, question, do you not think that would be a good exercise to get everybody on the same page? Um, well, I certainly think any time that we get together as you know, our stakeholders and talk about regional priorities um, is a good thing. And I think, uh, unfortunately, I think the I think we spoke about it at the uh, the, the forum we had regarding uh, uh, the climate and the sea. Uh, change and all the resiliency conference. And that not too long after that, of course, we, we really didn't have a, a forum to be able to bring that many people together, but we'll get to that point. And I think having something like that would be great. We'd be absolutely um, wanna be participating and, and helping any way we can in that. Um, the, uh, the more specific question, you know, this year we are taking a much more, um, I'd say, maybe aggressive is the right word, but at least proactive approach to grants, especially the federal grants and coordinating those because we'll submit three for the state of Florida. I mean, others can submit their, their applications. And so uh, we have a process to go through. It's not just district seven, it's all the districts. And we look for those that meet all the criteria and the criteria in the new grant um, is, some of the criteria is much different than you saw in previous um, uh, grant uh, with the build grants. There's things in there that didn't used to be there that we want to make sure our projects are meeting those criteria and will will stack well against the competition. Because as Harry said, there, there's a lot of competition um, and, and you have to really meet all of those new criteria. Some of the things like equity and environmental issues and other things that uh, have a much higher uh, uh, prominence on the new grants. But we can certainly provide that information and typically we do and, and we reach out to all of the agencies that are um, in that area to get letters of support and uh, we've been fortunate to be able to to get those on the ones that we've turned in and i did want to also just add on the one i mentioned about the streetcar and the brt the projects are not just for that that's one component of it a lot of the rest of it had to do with pedestrian improvements had to do with um, helping with some of the flooding problems they have in that area and so it was more but a side benefit of it that helps to fall into the criteria they're evaluating is that it also will help set up the abil abil uh, ability to build two transit projects that are currently um, in in the uh, in the federal process well that's I think this is a 
really productive and very robust conversation. I look forward to working on moving it forward because I'm reminding myself that, gee whiz, it must be about five years ago that we did that big transportation summit over at the airport in, yeah. in uh, Tampa. Um, I know the Tampa Bay Partnership was heavily involved in that, putting that together. So yeah, it's time to do it again. Madam Chair, I think that might help build some um, maybe more groundswell support that might encourage counties to get involved in a more positive way with some kind of regional solution. Yeah. If we uh, think it's a really good idea. Okay, so on that really great positive note, I, I am going to ask that we adjourn this meeting because we are 15 minutes late getting into finance, but Jennifer's going to say, how oh, that you haven't had citizen comment, right? Yeah. Um, well, that, but also um, we do have a quorum now. So if we could go ahead and do a vote on the consent agenda item, which is the minutes from February. Oh, very Move good. To approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So done and moved. And Thank now you. we will adjourn and start finance. And I forgot, is it you, Commissioner? Oh, am I? I'm in. I'm fine. Oh my God, we are really late. Okay, well, without further ado, um, any public comment, Chris? We have none. Okay. Uh, then I will ask, please, for a motion and a second on our February and March finance. Okay. Second. Second. No. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. All right. <laughs> Melanie, are you? Oh, there you are. Okay, yes. go forward and give our report, please. All right, good morning. Um, so the year to date through the month of March, we had a net surplus of 383,000. Now this 383,000 was 56,000 underneath the, underneath the budget amount of 439,000. So looking here at the revenues, we're under budget by $1.6 million. And this is mainly due to the use of funding of the 5307 funds and the timing difference between the pd &E and the technology project. Um, in correlation to the expenses, we're also under budget $1.6 million. And this is throughout the whole, um, basically all the expense categories. Moving on to the balance sheet. Um, for the end of March, our accounts receivable balance was 564,000 and our accounts payable balance was 398,000. And at the end of March, we had in our bank account 618,000. And that pretty much wraps up the uh, March financial summary report. I love knowing we have money in the bank. That is so music to my ears. We're gonna keep it that way, right, David? Okay. Uh, any comments, questions, or concerns with regard to the budget? Anybody? Good job, everyone. Thank you for all of your hard work. Um, shall we talk about, oh, is there any public comment? None. Thank you. How about we talk about the commuter van pool services as Diane Dorr Oh, there she is. Diane, quickly, please. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Please. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so what you have before you this morning is the commuter van pool a services contract amendment. Um, this amendment um, will, cut, will be the second year uh, of the commuter van pool program. Initially, the first contract was um, executed in 2018. It was a two-year contract with three one-year renewals. This would be the second renewal. This particular uh, renewal will be um, effective. It will be effective um, June 30th. I'm sorry, July 1st through June 30th, 2022, and uh, there were no changes that we have in this agreement. The funding for it is $400 a month. Um, staff is pleased with the services that has been provided, 
and therefore we are recommending approval of the second amendment to the commuter van pool program. Any questions or concerns? Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Anybody? No? No? I move approval to advance this to the full board for consideration. Okay. Second. Moved and approved uh, to advance this as a recommendation to the full board. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, the Pinellas Aerial Gondola Feasibility Study, Brian, I know, there you are. Good morning. So uh, before you is an action item to authorize the executive director to execute a one-year contract with SCJ Alliance for an amount not to exceed $779,271 to conduct the Pinellas Aerial Gondola Feasibility Study. At the August 2020 meeting, the board directed staff to work with Ford Pinellas on putting together a scope of work for a gondola study. We did that. We put together a scope of work that would look at two potential corridors, one in Clearwater that would connect downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach, and then one in St. Petersburg that would connect the area around Tropicana Field to the, to the St. Pete Pier. In February, we posted a request for qualifications. Four consulting firms responded to it. A review committee composed of one person each from T-Barda, Ford Pinellas, the city of St. Pete, and the city of Clearwater reviewed the proposals. Uh, SCJ Alliance came out on top. We were very impressed with their proposal. Stephen Dale, the project manager, has 15 years of experience in the urban gondola field. He's personally managed over 20 gondola feasible studies, and he's done research on gondolas for the Canadian Urban Institute. The funds for the study would come out of the Innovative Transit Solutions Public Transportation Grant that we received from the state. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions you have. Here, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, question, um, the, the part of the study that deals with the St. Pete and Tropicana Stadium, as you know, uh, City Council and, and perhaps uh, uh, Councilman Flowers can discuss this a little bit more. Um, uh, has or, or has voted to, uh, you know, to defer consideration of the, the final the prop kind of project pending what's going to happen uh, with, with with baseball and so forth. Will that impact the study at all? It's something that will be taken into consideration as we like look at what the best of route would be to connect the area. I mean, when I say Tropicana Field, we're talking about the general area. I know, I mean, I there's been no lines laid down on the on a map yet. So, okay, but that is something that we will coordinate with the city. So and keep in mind that there's a lot of things going on with regard to that discussion. Right. And I venture to say that it'll be resolved fairly quickly, number one. And number two, there are huge developments going on around that area that make it very uh, rich for public transportation options, given how many folks will be living and working and moving to and fro. So more to come, lots to come. Commissioner Stark. No, those were my same questions. I, I imagine the general area where it want, needs to land and where it begin, where, you know, the two terminus, termini um, are kind of known. It's just a, a matter of exact placement and looks and all that. So um, I'm, I'm good with going on, knowing that they're going to yeah, we have to because, as you all know, the county is the biggest financial partner, and anything that goes on there. So stay tuned. Oh, it's a great project. I just know some of the alignments might be a little bit right. massage due to the due to what's going to happen and ultimately. We'll give it a little, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. All right. I think it'll be very uh, exciting for the city. For both cities, both for the whole region, yeah. really, when you think about it. Excellent. Commissioner Flowers, did you have any comments? Um, yeah, you said pretty much what I was going to say, but I also wanted to share that, um, and I'm not going to say too much because I know since Janet and I served and we'll have our role to play, but I will say that um, I would, um, I know that these are just the starting points as it relates to, you know, location and transporting. Um, but one of the things I want us to be very careful with, even in Clearwater, is that you do have other parts of the community that are also very rich um, and could benefit 
from having this type of transportation to be able to span out, you know, from that. So whatever they're going to study and whatever information they bring back, I hope they also show us some examples of how uh, gondolas in other areas have um, been able to connect other communities. So that, yeah, because one of the main concerns in St. Petersburg has been how the interstate in fact divided the city and cut off traffic from coming into certain communities. And so to have something else that could be very uh, well responded to, Absolutely. but again, cutting off access from other communities, both in Clearwater and in St. Petersburg. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and the only other thing I wanna say is I was in Clearwater, I mean, I was in Orlando, I'm sorry. And just to watch the gondolas, you know, depending on where your room is, but just to see the gondolas as they're going, you know, by and whatnot. It, it seems like it will be quite interesting. <laughs> they have one in downtown Orlando? I don't know if it was downtown. I was at one of the hotels at a conference um, before COVID really got in and you could see gondolas, going, uh, a gondola going from one point to another. And it wasn't Disney World. Wow. It wasn't Disney World. So Disney World would have been on the other side of where my room was. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can check something out over there, but it was just interesting to see. And then lastly, don't lose sight of the new uh, proposed CRA in North Clearwater that will yes. reinvigorate entire communities there. Greenwood to Clearwater Beach. Yep. So that's all going to be, and it takes it right down to the waterfront. I mean, it's really exciting. So mm -hmm. the future is very bright. Lots to come. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Brian. Oh, and, uh, and do we need to take a vote on this as a recommendation? As a recommendation to the board. Uh, it's been moved and approved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Please. Okay. Very good. Is there any other business to come before the Finance Committee? Anyone? No? How about future meeting subjects? David? Uh, just the audit, the FY 2020 audit. We are working on that uh, and should wrap that up within the next several weeks and uh, hope to be prepared to, to present that to you all next month. Excellent. And I see that our next uh, finance committee meeting is scheduled for May 21st at 9 a.m. Please make every effort to be there. We're going to have a lot of exciting things going forward to talk about and Forum is really important to this board to help us move when forward. When is it? Uh, May 21st. Oh my God. What? what uh, if my life goes well, I won't be here. I'm trying to do something. Not that this isn't fun. <laughs> Okay, look at that. What we, could be more fun than this? We cut off on all of our missed time because of our last conversation. So we have almost three or four minutes before we have to start our next meeting on policy, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Very good. So we are adjourned from finance. Any public comments, Chris? Oh, they're not. Very good. Excellent. Yay. minutes wow. i'm gonna run to the ladies room are we are we live you're military right oh it's a great band oh and skills yeah i know i can't believe it. you're passionate okay and, and um yeah american manufacturing skills Initiative, but we have um, samskills.org if you want to look. Okay. Ahead. We just got passed last week. Um, so we 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 got the attention of ARM, Advanced Robotics mm -hmm. Manufacturing Institute, we're out of Pittsburgh. And they've given us a grant. Um, they, um, they, they love us. They asked us last year to do a conference. It's coming out first. And I'm the first. Um, NIST, National Institute of Yeah, they do a lot. Right? Um, we didn't, we didn't win that, but we were in the oh, final. Okay. Okay. Um, and the idea was for us to take our program into cities that are armed that have a arm membership. It's all about robotics sure. all around the country, and um. Uh, yeah, they yeah. cannot keep up. Yeah, that's
that's why I started this. Yeah. And um, I've led quite a few missions to Germany, of course, wanted to show uh, some people around here how the European apprenticeship model it works over there. And um, and so uh, that's interesting you're talking about this. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. good. No, good. Rick, Rick's very supportive of what we do. Yeah. And um and his predecessor, Stu, um, Stuart was as well. As a matter of fact, um when the US Chamber of Commerce came over and worked with the partnership to work on the talent pipeline, they picked healthcare and manufacturing. And then uh, the consortium of manufacturers um looked for a training program that they wanted to get behind that. So we were we were the recipient of that Tampa partnership program with Tampa Bay Works. Okay. And um okay. and as a matter of fact, uh, what's his name who's running Tampa Bay Works? I can't remember his name right now. Um he's on our board now and still he's a black guy. He ran arm. Yeah, yeah, and I know who he is. <laughs> no, I didn't I do I, I just kept because he came down and gave us a briefing on I was on the talent committee for the uh Tampa Bay partnership. Oh, you want to tell the video? I okay. was a so Deloitte representative. Yeah. And okay. since I've left Deloitte, I'm no longer on there. Yeah. You know, I've retired. I used to be on the partnership when it was paid 50,000. I was on the, the right. The council. Right. I was they on, took elected people out. Yeah. And Deloitte was uh, Deloitte is a partner yeah. there too. And so I was on that talent committee and a lot of people were back there, which mm -hmm. I was happy to hear because no, I no. Have we have that. people going to college too. We have yeah, people getting, yeah. and we have in our program. We have apprentices who who have gone to college and their company is paying for it, okay. and they're going to be electron, uh, in, uh, electronic engineers, or mechanical engineers, and they're coming back to those companies. Okay. But so, so we started this boot camp with Camp Bay Works and um, and uh, what's his name? Who we can't remember. And it's been so successful. We are kicking butt. Are you bringing in military? Um, so we we're doing we have retired veterans that we get you know and and, and, and the homeless vets and all that going back in, but um, okay so backing up a little bit so Dallas, it, Dallas College Community College System applied for a NIST grant and that the lead and they won it so we're in on their grant to bring our our boot camp file to Dallas but last week. Um, Arm asked us to um, go in with them as the lead on a federal DOD grant to bring our training program to the Bay area um, uh, with the focus on robotics. So we're kind of, this is two, a $10 million grant, five million grant. I don't remember the intervals between the two, but kind of excited to, um, it is to see that, you know, of course it's competitive. It would be multiple congressmen that get involved. But, yeah, but arms already in with the, I mean, the DOD is our main focus. Oh, yes, yes. Now, yes. no, later I'll hit all. So we can sit down and talk. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. We're, we've got an appropriation going through in Tallahassee. We just, we were in a, yeah, um, our main I'll office and center was in a um, Marchman Technical College, as part of the Tallahassee Center School. But we bought our, our, our own building now and mm -hmm. we are uh, working on the first. Yeah, 54 and Starkey Boulevard. 54 and Starkey. Starkey Blueberry Farm. It's going to be on Channel 10. Channel you, 10's uh, out there. Are you open what, 9 to 5 to the public to come in? Yeah, every day, some days a week. Actually, it's to 7 30. And you know what? Right now, it's kind of this trifecta thing. It's very odd, but we have blackberries, strawberries, and blueberries. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, you pick the blueberries and it's strawberries. Strawberries are waning, but they're still very delicious, even if they aren't beautiful. Um, and then our blackberries just exploded this week up in our, our barn. We have a bar barn day. So um, uh, it's, uh, that's where you get the blackberries. And then you can go over and do you know um, uh, Big Storm Brewery? Yep. Yeah, so they right now have a Starkey. Uh, strawberry blonde ale that you can okay. enjoy. We have to try <laughs> that. We'll have to try that. Yeah, but we had 21,000 blueberry pickers last year, and we're beating that. It's a fun day. It's a nice setup that we have on the lake. Because everybody wants to get out. Now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you're in perfect place. And then you just drive up the street, and then we have the market and the barn, and you're getting 
Okay. We'll wait for long to get back and then we'll go ahead and start. I don't think ours will take that long. We'll keep everybody. So my um my son in law is becoming a commander. He's Lieutenant Colonel. D. Where's he at? Fairchild. Okay. Oh, he's going to be a squadron commander. Yeah. Very nice. I'm flying out there for his ceremony. Okay. Um, and um, he worked for General Brown. Oh yeah. <laughs> so he's got a good personal Char we used to call him Charlie, Charlie Brown. And yeah, now he's you know running the airport. Yeah, yeah. So he's a good guy too. Um, I was in his office when when I, when he had his pinning ceremony at um, uh, Pearl Harbor last year. I w I went um, and but General Brown was being vetted for his job, so he wasn't. He was back in Washington. Yeah. But it's a good person to have watching your career as long as he stays there a little longer. But uh, my daughter said that pretty quickly they think they'll be going because things have really heated up for them uh, in the military. Oh, yeah. We had heard that when we were in Hawaii, but it's even ramped up more. Yeah, they'll stay pretty busy for the next couple of years. Yeah. So I think they're. I think their destination is Cutter. Cutter. Yeah. Cutter. I think that's some people pronounce it. Six months or so. It's usually a six or nine month thing. Yeah. That's okay. He'll get that. The good thing is, squadron command is one of the requirements for wing command, one of the requirements for 06. So he'll get that. And then he's got his deployment overseas as a So another requirement right there. So oh, really? Okay. So I, don't, I have no idea the rules. Yeah, there we use there was five things we always look for. He's he's starting to check them all. He's thirty five. He's young, young. You know, he'll have to go to um, war college. Yeah. So if he can get to war college. Yeah. Where's that? Um, he can go to a number of war colleges. Air war college. Maybe. He can go to any of the war colleges. It, it's it's um I should call it, it, it it's senior officer school. Okay. And so it's um, but it, but it's Highly competitive again, but with a squadron command in his in his pocket. Because I think he's going to stay in. Yeah, he ought to. If he's an, if he's a lieutenant colonel, he'd be not he'd be nuts not to stay in for a little while. Oh. And 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 he enjoys it very much. Oh. And he'll know if he's going to be competitive for O six before he even has to make the decision. Okay, and what does O six mean again? Oh. oh, colonel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that is a goal. Didn't know. Well, something about what's going on here. Everything's live. We're all live. Oh. Well, it's turned off. They're not supposed to be working that way. I don't know why. What? Okay. Well, they weren't muted because you could hear everything. Okay. And well, that's I got okay. A phone we didn't call. say anything wrong. Just saying. Well, shoot, though. And with that, our land skills they went national and viral there. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. With that said, Jennifer, are we ready to go for the policy? Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and call the April policy committee meeting to order at this time. Do we have any public comment? Gotcha. No public comment heard. Um, we'll move right on to item three, consent agenda. We have two uh, committee meeting minutes we have to approve, both February and March. Move approval of both of them, please. Second. Okay, I have uh, a motion and a second. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. Any nays? No. All approved. Thank you. We'll move right into an information item, and this is going to be given by uh, Chris Jadick. Uh, it's the trans. Transit and telework survey results, which if you had a chance to review them, were, were very interesting and very supportive. Chris, you ready to do that? Rich, I appreciate that. And I will uh, I will keep this uh, brief and keep us on track. There's a number of slides here, but I'd remind everybody the complete survey results are in your packet and they're posted online. So after the Envision 2030 plan was adopted by the board last year and David was making the rounds talking to local leaders, the question came up on one meeting, what was the business community thinking about our plan? Had we gauged any reactions? And that started a conversation with us to do a post Envision 2030 survey, looking at how the recommendations related to Ibarra were perceived by the public. We also saw an opportunity given that we were in the COVID crisis to see what impact telework might have on transit, to see what some of those impacts are. 
and make a broader public outreach. So this survey was conducted for the first three months of this year, received 400, 549 responses. The questions as you see were on telework, transit experience, and TBARDA's role in future regional transit. The sampling is a convenient sample. It is not a scientific survey. It was distributed to as many people who would like to take it in our five county area, and we did get good response to it. But I'd remind people that we're not demographically selective or making any recommendations based on this. This is a conversation starter and to see if we have some, some friends that might be worth exploring in the future. And the results I'm going to show you here are rounded to the next highest percentage. So first of all, asking where people lived, the majority of those who responded to this survey were in Hillsborough County at 58%, Pinellas County naturally second at 22%. Interestingly, when we asked, where do you work? The majority are in Hillsborough County. Most of the people who responded to this survey in Hillsborough County worked in Hillsborough County, uh, whereas people in Pinellas would move to other counties a little more often than the people in Hillsborough County would. We also wanted to know, do you lead or manage employees? Because the impetus for this survey was, what does the business community think of the Envision 2030 plan? So we really asked two tiers of questions. We asked some questions to the business community about their transit telework experience. And then we also asked the, the uh, general public for their similar experiences as well too. So we could have a demographic breakdown of that as we analyze the results. So looking at business results, we first asked about telework because that was really something that changed our transit and transportation habits over the past year. And we wanted to find out what was your organization's telework experience from that management perspective. 53% had a positive experience in that they said their employees were more productive than they expected. 6% said our employees were less productive than expected. We asked then what will your organization's future telework policy be? 60% say they will offer more telework after the pandemic than they did before the pandemic. So we're not measuring it as of right now, but we're saying prior to the pandemic with what you knew about telework, now that you know more about it, are you going to be more lenient with it? And you can see 60% say more. And I think that's a very interesting trend. About 7% say they will actually offer less telework than they did prior to the pandemic. We asked similar questions of employees. What was your telework experience? Did you like it? Did it work out well? And the results were similar. 58% said they had a positive telework experience in that they were more productive than they expected. 5% were negative. And that reflects pretty much the correlation is pretty much the same with, with management. We also asked what they thought their organization's future telework policy will be. And they also reflect what the business sentiment is they expect by 53% majority to have more telework opportunities in the future. 4% expect there may be some less. We also asked employees about mass transit. And we wanted to know, are you going to use mass transit the same way or differently? Interestingly, I will point you down to the bottom bar, which says 29% don't know. And I think that reflects the fact that we are in a telework experience now. People have not returned to work, so they're not clear about how transit will be part of their future experience. Between whether they would use it more or less, you can see there's really not much of a difference there. Those who say 60% are the same, they will use it the same regardless of whether they use mass transit or not. So those who did not use mass transit before and will not use in the future would be in that same category. But roughly a third aren't quite sure. So we think there might be some changes in the way people use mass transit in the future based on future telework policies. We also asked about alternative transportation, that being defined as carpools, van pools, biking and walking. And we saw similar sentiment here as well too. Really not a shift between whether people will use more or less, but you have 27% who are not quite sure. And we think this may be an opportunity for our van pool program, which we've undertaken a public outreach program now with some of our STP funds. So we're hopeful that that's going to hit an audience that is rethinking their commute and rethinking how they're going to uh, get to their employment. I then wanna move on and talk to you about some of the slides about what TBARDA's role should be when it comes to developing regional transit. We first wanted to ask what people think about Tampa Bay's economy. How do you rate Tampa Bay's economy compared to similar regions? Well, people give us a pretty favorable result. 39% say that we are better than average uh, and 10% say we're much better than average. So you could say close to 50% see us above average uh, compared to other regions of the, con uh, the country. When we look at our transportation system, and that means not just not mass transit, but highways in every way, airports, every way by which we get around in this area, how do you rate our transportation system? The averages start to go down a little bit. We see 11% believe that we're above average, 3% well above average, but really the majority, a third, 32% say below average and 22% say well below average. 
as we move on to public transit systems, and we asked how are our public transit systems rated, the results continue to deteriorate. You can see 23% say that our public transit systems across our five county area, this is not reflective of any individual transit agency, but 23% say below average and 42% say well below average. We asked, do you think Tampa Bay would benefit from increased regional transit regardless of the mode? And you can see there's strong support for regional transit here. 55% agreed with that statement, 27% agreed. 82%. So 82%. That adds up to 82%. Yeah, you're very quick on the math there. 82% either strongly agree or agree that Tampa Bay would benefit from increased regional transit. And I put in regardless of the mode because we've had conversations about rail and bus rapid transit and ferry service. There are a lot of different types of regional transit. This just is talking about you know, the concept itself of regional <laughs> transit that connects Tampa Bay. Do you think regional transit would increase opportunities for workers through more access to jobs? This also received a favorable re uh, uh, response, 84% say either strongly agree or agree. So once again, they see not only a reason to want regional transit, but they see a benefit in economic opportunity. Do you think improved regional transit would increase opportunities for employers for more access to workers? Remember the impetus for this was what does business think about TBART and TBART's role? 49% uh, strongly agree, believe there'd be economic opportunity for employers because they would have access to a broader workforce. And adding up those numbers, you can see very strong majority either strongly agree or agree, there'd be more opportunities for employers. We then moved on to some specific questions about TBARDA and the Envision 2030 plan. We noted that the Envision 2030 recommendations are unfunded. We wanted to know what priority do you place on increased investment in regional transit which we define for this survey as county to county across our five counties. 16% say it should be the highest priority, 46% say high priority. So together at 62% saying that there should be very high priority. One, one out of four say it's an average priority. The low priority numbers are uh, much smaller than those who say a high priority or a very high priority. How important is it for one agency such as TBARDA to lead regional transit planning in cooperation with FDOT, county governments, MPOs, yeah. and and local transit agencies. Part, and like and right you can see the reason we are asking that is because we are partners with our local governments. We're looking to help local governments solve problems. So we wanted to define it that way. And you can see there's also strong support with nearly a third, 29% saying it's extremely important and 44% saying it's very important. And note that this question had T-BARDA in the question. So we're asking a specific question about T-BARDA's role. Another question, how important is it for one agency such as TBART to expand and operate regional transit? Again, in cooperation with our local entities, again, very important, 29% extremely important, 43% very important. And then we asked, how important is it for Florida to provide dedicated budget support for TBARTA to expand regional transit? 74% say it's either extremely important or very important. That's three out of four. And so we think that's a very strong endorsement uh, that TBARTA be given some financial support to do the work that we want to do. One other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to break out the Hillsborough County responses compared to the rest, because you noted more than 50% of the respondents were in Hillsborough County. And sometimes we ask ourselves, well, is, does Hillsborough County have a different philosophy about regional transit compared to the other outlying counties? And as far as this survey is concerned, there really is no difference. Hillsborough County in this survey is just as supportive of regional transit and T-BARTA as the other four outlying categories. So on the question I just posed there, how important is it for Florida to provide dedicated budget support to TBARDA? When we looked at the Hillsborough County only residents, you can see extremely important was 26%, very important 46%. So those numbers uh, are very close to what the numbers are for the other four counties when you separate that. And the, uh, the disagreement with that statement is low on both counts. In fact, uh, not important at all, which those is the lowest category, was only 5% of the Hillsborough County respondents and 8% of those in the other four counties. And I'm going to break out a couple of questions here before I wrap out, also taking a look at the Hillsborough County only responses. Do you think Tampa Bay would increase from increased regional transit regardless of the mode? 81% of Hillsborough County respondents say yes. They strongly agree or they agree that compares to 84% of the other four counties. And a final question here, how important is it for one agency such as TBARTA to expand and operate regional transit in cooperation with our local governments? You can see there is still strong support in the Hillsborough County only respondents, 
26%, extremely important compared to 33% among the other four outlining categories. 47% say it's very important compared to 38%. So I hope we find those, uh, those findings of interest. As mentioned, it is a convenient sample. It's not a scientific study, uh, but we did want to do some uh, outreach internally. Uh, there was not expense uh, put to this survey. It was uh, done through our internal resources. And uh, if you have any questions, I am open to those. Thank you. Share these with the other transit agencies that uh, we support? We certainly can, yes. Okay. Any other questions? We'll move on to the next item. Um, and I hope Brian Fazaro is here. Um, that is a discussion and action item on public transportation agency safety plan update. Brian. Again, so before you is an action item recommending that the board approve the 2021 update to TBARDA's public transportation agency safety plan or PTASP. Um, we adopted our initial safety plan last July. FTA requires that it be reviewed and updated annually. Um, the purpose of the PTAS is essentially it's to make sure the transit agencies are actively considering safety in all aspects of their operation, whether out on the road or in the office. TBAR, we're a small agency, so obviously our safety plan is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, we have a safety committee that meets quarterly. It includes our partners from Commute Enterprise. Primarily, we meet to discuss if there's been any van pool related accidents, what the circumstances were, and if anything could have been done to prevent the accident. Like I said, FTA requires that we update this plan annually. Our 2021 update includes just two minor edits. Um, the performance metrics for the Vanpool program, which are in your packet, have been updated to add 2020 data and references in the document to director of commuter services have been changed to manager of commuter services. And that's it. So like I said, this is an action item recommending that the board approve the update. Anybody? I'll move to approve the uh, recommendation of staff to advance this to the full board. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so moved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item six, uh, which is other business. Any other business? Okay. The future meeting subjects, we'll work on that between now and then, um, unless there's any here that want to be brought forward. Um, uh, next meeting, uh, as been stated before, will be May 21st uh, with the other committee meetings. And unless there are any questions, comments, or anything, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Seeing none, meeting's adjourned. Thank you.
Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? This Chris can hear me. Cody, oh. I can't hear you. Okay, great. All right. I want to make sure I can hear everybody. Thank you. Morning, Commissioner Kemp. Good morning. I was just trying to look and saw that my mic was on and didn't know it yet. <laughs> Hey, ready to go? Call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the T-Barda April board meeting. Uh, Rich, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America, and to the uh, thank you, Jennifer. Please call the roll. Here. Cliff Manuel should be on his way. Commissioner Long. Here. Mayor Castor. Mayor Kreisman. Here. Rich McLean. Here. Commissioner Kemp. Here. Commissioner Starkey. Here. Commissioner Bellamy. Commissioner Narverud. Commissioner Flowers. Oh, Secretary yeah. Kreisman. Here. Secretary Nandam. Here. 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 Thank you. Okay, we may proceed. We do not have a quorum. We are waiting on Cliff to arrive. Okay, and he's anticipated to be here. Yes, sir. 
All right, we'll go on then with public comment. Can you give the PSA, please? Give public comment can either do that in person through the public comment card, or they may also send their public comments to public comment at cbarda.com one day prior to the meeting. We did not receive anything via email, and I'm going to go to Chris on whether or not we have it in the lobby today. Okay. We have no we have no public comment. Okay, no public comment. Then our next item is the Hillsborough Planning Commission board presentation, and the chair recognizes Cody Powell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am uh, very honored and proud uh, to be here today to present uh, the Envision 2030 team uh, with two uh, 38th Annual Planning and Design Awards. The Planning Commission's Celebration of Excellence in Planning and Design in Hillsborough County was held virtually on the Plan Hillsborough YouTube channel last October due to the pandemic. While we had hoped to have been able to present the awards to you in person before now, we didn't want to delay uh, you know, getting your trophies to you any longer. The judges felt the Envision 2030 team did such an outstanding job uh, of integrating the technical and the public uh, engagement components of the plan that they were award worthy in separate entries as standalone projects. The, uh, the first award I would like to present uh, is the award of merit in the planning category to envision 2030, future of transit in Tampa Bay. Developed by Tibarda, Envision 2030 created Tampa Bay's first regional planning transportation plan that would provide more mobility options, increase uh, access to jobs, and enhance quality of life. The plan incorporates a mix of uh, traditional transit, innovation, environmentally sustainable transit technologies um, to continue to drive you know, Tampa Bay forward. Uh, the judges felt it encompassed a very robust planning process and that the resulting to-do list was concise and manageable. They also remarked how the peer regional agencies analysis showed great leadership uh, in allowing the organizations to provide input to achieve a successful plan. So congratulations uh, to David and Chris uh, for creating a, a model of future regional transportation plans. The uh, second award we'd like to present uh, is uh, the award of excellence in participation category to the Envision 2030 Public Transportation Plan. Our judges were impressed by the number of things the team were able to accomplish and how they were able to actively engage uh, the public throughout the entire process. The year long campaign you know, effectively leveraged key marketing channels and strategies and included branding, website development, social media outreach, video, uh, news media, public appearances, presentations, and surveys. Uh, the judges felt that the comprehensive outreach campaign was undoubtedly an innovative of tremendous value uh, to the community. It can easily be used as a model for other communities across the nation. So congratulations uh, to Dave uh, Green and Chris uh, Jadik. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Sorry if I, uh, if I messed that up. Uh, and the entire uh, Envision 2030 team. Um, you know, again, thank you very much, uh, you know, for having me here today. Uh, projects like these uh, are the reason why Tampa Bay uh, continues to be such a great place to live, work, uh, and play. Um, thank you very much and appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Cody. And on behalf of the board and staff, I welcome you to talk to us today and thank you for these wonderful awards. They're here on the, on the dais now. We're very proud of the work we all did in 2030, especially our staff. And we're very happy with the participation from Hillsborough County and your staff in this process. And we hope that this momentous occasion will spur future cooperation among the different uh, Tampa Bay regions to really further, you know, transportation of a regional nature, nature that impacts all of us in the area. So thanks for your help. We look forward to the continued good work and cooperation with your agency. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next item up is consent agenda items. We, we don't have a quorum yet, as, as Cliff called in. 
out to him again. Okay. We'll go on and loop back then to those votes uh, when he arrives. Um, uh, next up is a discussion and action items. Uh, first is the Citizens Advisory Committee report and Bill Roberts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the T-Barta board and guests. Uh, I'm Bill Roberts. I represent the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee uh, for your T-Barta board. Uh, I'm happy to give this brief report. We, we recently held our April meeting uh, we covered a number of items, heard a couple of presentations, which uh, this board uh, you're, you're going to see today. Um, we did have a presentation on the status of the RRT project from our, our good friend, Scott Pringle. And um, I'd like to relay a few of the comments. We, we took no action on that item. Uh, it was for informational purposes only. But I thought your board might find it uh, instructive to hear a few of the comments uh, that were made uh, as part of the discussion, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, uh, the, the, one of the comments was that the, the major cost in the RRT project seemed to be in the cost of the stations uh, and that uh, the stations uh, and the number of stations was a driving factor, not just in the cost but also in the, in the ridership projections uh, that we've been shown. Um, we were also uh, advised that the time frame for the RRT is tied very closely to the uh, TBX project. So I'm glad Secretary Gwynn is on with us this morning uh, so that we can continue to monitor the progress of that, uh, of that FDOT project. Um, uh, one of our members commented that, uh, that this project uh, did not seem like it was quite there yet, that it still needs some fine tuning in terms of the number of stations um, and, uh, and trying to reach a balance between what the RRT proposes to accomplish uh, as, uh, as coordinated with each of our local uh, transit, a transit agencies uh, because the RRT uh, at least envisioned by our committee, is a fear to those local uh, uh, local transit agencies and vice versa. Um, and finally, one of our members commented that the uh, ridership projections uh, as shown by the most recent study uh, did not seem to meet uh, his expectations and he would hope that further fine tuning of both the number of stations and the actual finalization of a plan uh, would allow us to increase that ridership. So with those comments, Mr. Chairman, I, I will be happy to take any questions, but I want to continue to remind you that this committee is very engaged and uh, we feel like we'll be, we'll be happy to help you at any time and comment on any, any projects coming before the board. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill, for that informative report. And thanks again to you and members Committee for your service to the community. Uh, members, any questions uh, for Bill? Okay, thanks again. Uh, moving on then, next we'll hear the report from the Transit Management Committee. Uh, Kurt, you're recognized. Hello, sir, Kurt Scheibel of Pasco County Public Transportation and the uh, Transit Management Committee uh, Chair. We had some really good um, discussion about the uh, VIA microtransit and how they can provide for our area. Um, some really interesting numbers on how well it might be able to fit into the uh, Tibarda mold of providing transportation in areas that will, uh, that right now are, may have difficulties receiving it or it's the best way to maximize the service with minimizing the costs. Additionally, we had a discussion about TD Tampa Bay and the uh, upcoming application uh, or renewal, I believe, of the application with the Commission with Transportation Advantage. Got some really good discussion on how well it's doing and the service that it is providing and how it's continually growing for the region and providing some of that cross-county uh, transportation service. And then we had a, a regional update uh, on 88 service from Brian Pisano. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian. Uh, Brian. Uh, about how uh, Tabarda might be able to help with uh, ADA service throughout the uh, area. Um, there was uh, both positives and negatives to that with a lot of hurdles that uh, we're just not ready to address, I believe. So the committee was uh, looking for more discussion down the road. Uh, 
but it was not quite there yet. So um, we had a very, I thought, very productive meeting uh, with a lot of engagement from all counties on all the different issues. So on that, I'll take any questions from the board. Thank you for the report. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, yeah, thanks again, and thanks for all the great work you guys do at the committee. Uh, next, uh, Chair recognizes Brian Bizarro for an update on the 2015 Express Bus Service. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at the February board meeting, uh, staff sought approval of the locally preferred alternative for the RRT study. The board did not adopt an LPA. Instead, it directed staff to develop a new alternative that would consider express bus and express lanes. Uh, this was an alternative that was based on a 2015 express bus study. Included in the board's motion was a request that staff determine whether express bus and express lanes could be converted to RRT at a later date. WSP, our consultant's been working diligently on that request, and we're here today to present this new alternative. Um, and there's actually three. There are two alternatives that are express bus and express lane. And the third one is really, it's, it's a hybrid that combines some of the aspects of RRT with the express lane option. This uh, agenda item, it's an information item. We're not asking for board action today on the locally preferred alternative, however, we do need direction from the board on which direction we're going with the project. Is it going to be in a direction of RRT? Is it going to be express bus? Some combination of the two or something else? Because we've, we've reached a point in a study where um, until we get direction from the board, we're at a standstill on where we can go further with the project. With that, I will hand things over to Scott Pringle from WSP. Thank you, Brian. Good, miss, good morning, Mr. Uh, Chair Holton and board members. Um, please confirm that you can hear me. Yes. Uh, so just like Brian mentioned, I'm gonna walk you through the work that we've done. Uh, uh, you know, quite a bit of work we've pushed through to the last couple of months to get you some information to make that comparison as you requested in February. So, um, you know, obviously our mission has always been rapid regional service, just like Brian mentioned, we're um, looking to complete milestone three. We started that conversation in January uh, that continued into February, at which time staff made the technical recommendation for the regional rapid transit project, which included freeway based BRT on the majority of the project. Um, as Brian indicated, the board did ask us to take a look at a comparison between the express bus and express lane service that was a recommendation from a 2015 study and compare that to the recommended locally preferred alternative that we presented in January and February. So quickly, this is a comparison between the two different uh, recommendations. So the 2015 study was a partnership between District 7 and the Hillsborough MPO. Um, and it did look at uh, express bus service in, at that time, express lanes throughout the majority of the 275 corridor. This was reflective of, at that time, the TB Next program. Um, as you are all aware, uh, since then, we are uh, do working on the TB Next program program, which is uh, made some uh, modifications to the improvements on the interstate. Most notably, um, in 2015, we're looking at express lanes north of downtown Tampa. That is no longer part of the FDOT program. So from that point forward, we're looking at either uh, mixed service or dedicated lanes. Um, Obviously the 2015 study uh, was using older jobs and population data information. That's 2035. We've updated that to 2045, which is the current projections. Um, the 2015 study did use the, uh, at that time, what they call the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Model. Uh, we did not have the uh, recommended FTA uh, stops model. It's the simplified trips on project software, which is now what the Federal Transit Administration really recommends for all projects to use, especially if they're looking for that federal grant application. Um, at that time in 2015, the focus was on six stations, whereas, uh, as you all are aware, we were looking at 13 stations for the Regional Rapid Transit Project. So as Brian mentioned, we've actually developed three new alternatives to make this comparison. Uh, two alternatives are a variation on that express bus and express lane service. And then we also looked at what we call alternative seven. So the express bus and express lanes alternatives are 6A, 6B. 
Alternative seven is what if we take the same recommendation from January and February, the locally preferred alternative, and but only did six stations. What, what benefit or impact does that have on ridership and the use of the project? So these three alternatives really give us a great opportunity to talk about two primary pieces of the project. Number one, what's the benefit of using express lanes versus the dedicated lanes? And number two, what's the benefit of 13 stations versus six stations? So first I'm gonna talk about that alignment conversation, uh, specifically express lanes as compared to dedicated lanes. Uh, you can see the maps here. So alternative 6A, is using express lanes from downtown St. Petersburg through Gateway across the Howard Franklin Bridge. But at that point, if we want a station in West Shore that's off the interstate, so it's in the neighborhood, in the West Shore area, we would actually have to get off the interstate. And unfortunately, we would not be able to get back into the express lanes to get all the way to downtown Tampa. So from that West Shore area, 6A really looks at mixed traffic from West Shore all the way to Pasco. Now, 6B, the variation is West Shore again. So the original 2015 study, its intent was to use as much express lanes as possible. We wanted to honor that intent and reflect that in the comparison that we provide to you today. Um, so you'll see that we looked at express lanes use all the way from St. Pete to downtown Tampa. However, to accommodate that, we would have to have some infrastructure investments through the State Route 60 interchange, including that West Shore Intermodal Center, which would be a platform in the median of the interstate with a catwalk over over to the F dot, the proposed F dot property. Again, alternative seven, the same recommendation that we brought to you in January and February. However, this is six stations, not 13. So throughout the study, we've always talked in terms of daily ridership in 2020. So what kind of ridership we're we gonna get here today in the present? Um, because that's what the federal government requests from us, it requires from us. For this comparison though, we did look at not only what we think the ridership will be today, but what would it be in 2030, which is what we think the possible opening year for this project could be, um, as well as the long-term look, which is 2045. So you can see those numbers there. And again, a quick reminder, 6A and 6B are those express lanes. And you can see the level of boarding where about seven, a little over 700 or a little over six and a half, a hundred in daily boardings in 2020. And we do see growth through the years, through 2030 to 2045. However, when we look at the, again, the dedicated lanes, what you can see, you are getting uh, uh, more than double the amount of daily ridership just by investing in those dedicated lanes. And then really the most telling thing is that growth from year to year. When you start looking out to 2030 and even out to 2045, you know, we're seeing almost a 400% growth in ridership from the dedicated lanes. And, that, and that's pretty intuitive because you're looking at you know, future years where there's gonna be more congestion on the interstate. So having that dedicated space for that transit service is just gonna make it that much more attractive for the rider. Uh, we also wanted to make some comparisons between the travel times between those express lanes and the dedicated lanes. Um, you'll see in the top row here, uh, again, using the local model, we're anticipating about 90 minutes if you're in a, in a car to get from Wesley Chapel all the way to downtown St. Pete. Um, we also looked at what's the best we can do with existing transit service. So there's two routes in, in, in Pinellas PSTA, Route 52 and the 300X that roughly replicates getting from St. Pete to downtown Tampa. And then of course, Hart has the 275LX, which is uh, going from Wesley Chapel to downtown Tampa. Um, if you look at the travel time along that corridor, you can see there's a pretty significant amount of time to get from end to end. You're looking at over 170 minutes total travel time. However, when, again, when we look at that investment in the dedicated lanes, you can see a major in, uh, improvement in that travel time and a lot of travel time savings as a result. Anywhere between 80 to over 100 minutes in total travel time savings as compared to existing local transit. However, I will say that when you look at the express lanes, you also see a major uh, benefit in terms of travel time. You're looking at between 90 to 96 minutes in travel time savings, again, as compared to local transit. So there really is a very uh, an important benefit from the use of the express lanes. 
Um, so we've also uh, dug a lot deeper into the data and started looking at actually where people are getting on, where are they going to, and how are they using the service county by county. Um, you'll see in the pie charts on the top, the light blue are folks who are crossing county lines. So they got on the service in one county and traveled to another, whereas the gold is uh, folks who stayed in the same county. So when we look at 6A and 6B, we're really seeing a very regional service, right? We're seeing the majority of folks who are crossing county lines. When we go to that alternative seven, which has uh, you know, the dedicated lanes, you do see the change there in the usage uh, in terms of people crossing county lines and internal. It's not that we're losing trips, those regional trips of folks crossing county lines, is when we uh, invest in that dedicated lane in Hillsborough County, we just see a lot more act activity in Hillsborough County as a result. So that's what's changing the percentages. And you can really see that here when we look at the boardings per county, uh, we've got Pinellas in light blue, Hillsborough in dark blue and Pasco in gold. Uh, whereas with the express lanes, you're about 59% uh, usage in Hillsborough County. And then it jumps up all the way up to 70% um, when you add those dedicated lanes. So as I mentioned before, the next comparison is the 13 stations to the six stations. Um, just for a, a point of clarity, we are looking at the dedicated lanes as, as the point in the background for this information. However, all our comparisons are specifically, what's the benefit of 13 stations versus six stations? So we looked at 2045, so that's that long-term future, future year. And when we're looking at the dedicated lanes with the 13 stations, we're getting good ridership, upwards of 13,000 riders per day, um, whereas six stations, you can see a noticeable drop in that ridership where we're actually coming in below 5,000 uh, 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 riders per day. Um, interestingly enough, uh, our team kind of went into this exercise expecting that you would see a major shift in the way people use the service when you went from 13 to six stations. Ideally, you know, pushing those riders to those major activity centers However, we do see some shift, but not what we expected. Um, and what unfortunately we see happening is when you start removing stations from the equation, you just seem to lose ridership. So you're just no longer efficiently serving those neighborhoods and those communities, and those folks are no longer interested or, or find the project attractive for their, for their daily use. Uh, again, same comparison that we made with the alignment in terms of uh, county to county activity. Um, again, when you look at the six stations, 45-55 mix, 45% of the folks are count crossing county lines, very regional, you know, almost all transportation projects tend to be internal. Um, and then what's interesting is when you look at the 13 stations, and again, what we're finding is there's a lot more activity in Hillsborough County. Um, that 13 station scenario really is performing at a very high level. Um, but I think this is probably one of those areas where we uh, could, should discuss and the opportunity for refinement. Um, the goal of this project, the mission of this project has always been to provide a regional service. And when we see numbers where you've got 19% um, crossing county lines and over 80% staying internal, mostly in Hillsborough County, um, there may be some uh, opportunities to refine that number of stations. So that again, like Brian said, we're complementing what Hillsborough County's initiatives are, we're complementing that local service, and we're certainly, we don't wanna compete with that. That's never been the goal of this project. Um, and again, you can see the boardings by county. Um, and again, those six stations, uh, you'll see the percentages here in Hillsborough, Pinellas and Pasco, um, and also as you look at uh, the 13 station scenario. One important uh, point of conversation with the difference between 13 stations and six stations is how are we serving you know, the jobs in our region? How are we serving folks who really rely on transit on a day-to-day -day basis? So when you go from 13 stations, which is the dark blue to the six station scenario, unfortunately we do lose access to about over a hundred thousand jobs. So that's notable difference. When we look at folks who rely on transit, so those transit dependent populations and households, um, again, we look at the 13 versus the six, uh, there is a significant impact there where we're actually losing almost half of our transit dependent population using this project. Whereas 13 stations, we are just under 50,000 and that drops down to over 28,000. 
Um, and a lot of that has to do simply with the fact that at those major activity centers, the, you know, the average median income tends to be higher, whereas the stations that are being eliminated between the 13 and 6 uh, uh, tend to be the folks who do rely on transit. Um, at the February board meeting, uh, the question was also posed about converting the project over time. So the, the concept here was, can you start with an express bus service and then at some point in the future, move to those dedicated lanes? Um, we did have a conversation with Secretary Gwynn to confirm this statement um, as it stands right now uh, to convert the project from express bus service in Pinellas and north of Tampa to Pasco uh, is easily, I, won't, I don't wanna say easily done, but is definitely a, a possibility um, with actually uh, relatively minimal costs because the TBNX program has those wide hardened shoulders. So it would be just a matter of moving the, the service to those shoulders and making that dedicated. The one caveat to that though is between West Shore and downtown Tampa. That is by far the heaviest investment in infrastructure for the entire project. Um, and obviously if we're moving forward with that piece outside of the TBNX program and we're not part of that single construction phase, there would be a, an assumption that we would have probably some additional cost associated with that, being that we would no longer have that alignment with TB Next, and we wouldn't um, have that cost benefit of being aligned with FDOT, um, but it can still be done. Um, so with that, we'd like to open the conversation up to discussion. I have a few more summary points just before we start the conversation. Um, these are the costs when you look across the different alternatives, um, the two express alternatives. The big difference between the two here is that State Route 60 investment and that West Shore and Modal Center, um, you can see the impact in terms of cost. Um, and then the dedicated lanes are the six station and the 13 station here. This is its performance in terms of ridership, like I mentioned in the earlier slide. Um, and then when we look at uh, these different alternatives, I think in the conversation I know came up early in the committee meetings, um, you know, when we start thinking about that federal contribution. So the express lanes, unless uh, locally the MPOs federalize the project by using some of their federal dollars, we really don't have as great of an option to uh, uh, pursue the FTA capital investment grant dollars. So that takes off that federal contribution, which of course means a much higher responsibility in terms of cost for the state and local. Whereas dedicated lanes, we do think we have the potential to compete for those dollars. Um, I know in the committees earlier, the question came up about how much the uh, FTA might be funding projects. We've conservatively assumed 50%. That's kind of what the rule of thumb has been over the past several years. And we're hoping that does change and they do, do start honoring the law, which is up to 80%. So just like uh, Brian mentioned, uh, today is just uh, for discussion purposes. I'm uh, uh, Chair Holden, I'm ready to you know, address or answer any questions. And you know, just like Brian mentioned, um, you know, we're prepared to run some additional analysis and bring that back to you in May. Um, I just really would like to hear the, the board's uh, uh, interest in how they like to move the project forward. Thank you, Scott, for that great report. And I think you, you set the, the, the question really in focus here because we have to make a, a philosophical decision here. We hear from the public from prior slides and presentations that there is a huge desire for transit in Tampa Bay and this spans all of the counties. Um, the, the problem we're facing with here and we have to come up and face the fact is that there is wide that spread diversity of opinion on this board as to the best way to accomplish that in the context of this project. So this is what we have to decide today. And I, I anticipate a lively discussion from every member because there is broad uh, uh, consensus and broad difference of opinions on a lot of this. I think we have to face the fact that based on reports I have seen that Hillsborough County and their congressional delegation prefer rail in Hillsborough County. And so they're not necessarily a strong proponent of this, but they may be of a lesser group favoring less stations and more, more express bus. Uh, some of the other counties may favor the opposite because for them, that's a better choice. Uh, this is exactly what we're here to, as a regional board, we're, we're mandated to decide and make very hard decisions. So I, I definitely am looking forward to a discussion from all of the, the members of the board on their opinion on this. 
and I hope we can maybe not make a decision today, but focus the, the, the questions more precisely and then come to a consensus among the counties. Because what I, I fear happening is if we have a huge split between, just to be honest, Hillsborough County and, and the other counties involved here, we're gonna potentially lose getting funding for any of our projects. We, had, we have to face up to that fact. So with that said, I'll open it up to questions or comments or who would like to go first? Uh, Mayor, you wanna start in your uh, direction down there? I, I guess I'll, I'll go first here. So, um, I mean, I, I have always preferred, and it's always been my preference to see um, uh, the, uh, the rapid transit rather than the express. And the reality though is, uh, as you were saying, Mr. Chair, that if we're not all, no pun intended, if we're not all on board, um, it isn't gonna happen. And we have to take steps forward. The convertibility issue was really important to me uh, because the last thing I wanted us to do is to spend a great deal of money in one direction uh, if we end up going with express and not be able to convert that uh, to rapid transit. Because I do believe that even if we go the express route, once we establish that and we get people used to riding, I think much like what we've seen with the ferry, every year ridership has increased as people became more accustomed to saying, hey, I don't have to get in my car. I can use this other uh, method of transportation and get where I want to go. And this is kind of nice. Um, and so um, I, I think that, that um, I, I would be supportive of us moving forward at this point with the express. And then the question is, is are we looking at 6A or 6B? I think when you compare 6A and 6B from a cost analysis standpoint, and obviously we have to be concerned about that as good stewards of taxpayer dollars, that the difference is substantial. Uh, my understanding is a lot of it has to do with the, the, the West Shore station and the costs associated with that. Um, and uh, you know, my thinking is, is that if we get to that point where we are converting it, we become eligible for federal funding which then helps pay for that cost of changing that West Shore to what it potentially would be if we did it right now. Um, when you look at the time and the ridership differences between 6A and 6B, they're, they're not significant. They're not real consequential. So I think when you put all those factors together, uh, it, it, for me, it points me in the direction of 6A. Uh, I think for the, for the dollars that we're spending, um, we're not losing a lot when it comes to time and ridership versus 6B, but we're saving over $100 million in cost. Um, and again, we are moving the ball and we have to move the ball. Um, and I like the fact that it's converted. Thank you for those comments. Rich? Yeah, I, I feel I'm, I'm going to echo what the mayor just mentioned here, particularly the convertibility factor there was a swear for me. Um, I too was worried about the costs associated with the dedicated lanes. Um, and, and so I'm right there with them with the 6A, if you will. Okay, thank you for those comments. Uh, I will weigh in as well. I, I, I like this alternative. I think it's a compromise. Uh, I was most, most concerned in the presentation with the fact that there would be a huge disparity between transit dependent riders and, and you know, with the different varying options. But you have to ask yourself, since most of those are in Hillsborough County anyway, you know, their, their public transit system over there is going to make up for a lot of that differences. And I fully, you know, uh, have all the confidence in the world and heart and other agencies to do that. Um, so taking a moderate approach now, especially when it is convertible, would generally be my preference as well. So that said, I'll, I'll uh, recognize Commissioner Long. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. And I did hear Scott, I think, I see him still here, say that he was happy to consider other thoughts or options or whatever and come back in May so that we are clearly in a position to keep moving forward because we heard during our legislative committee earlier that only when we're project ready will we qualify for the new raise grant that uh, from the feds. And so well, I made the motion at the last meeting to look at an express bus in express lanes proposal. 
and I really appreciate the hard work that TVARTA staff and WSP have done in response to that motion. It seems to me in listening to Scott and going over the materials that there's a slight variation of express bus and express lanes that we have not yet considered as a board. So I'm hopeful that we can uh, look at projections of ridership, travel time, and cost alternatives that do not require the construction of transit lanes in the median of I-275 from downtown Tampa to the West Shore. We need to maximize our leverage of FDOT's investment in this corridor and begin the construction and operation of this project as efficiently and affordably and as timely as possible. And so therefore, Mr. Chair, when you're ready, I would like to make the motion that t staff and WSP bring back to this board two additional alternatives for our consideration, just for consideration. The first one would be an alternative consisting of bus on hardened shoulder lanes from Pasco County to downtown Tampa, then transitioning to travel in express lanes from downtown Tampa to downtown St. Pete. And secondly, an alternative consisting of bus on hardened shoulder lanes from Pasco County to downtown Tampa, then tra transitioning to travel in express lanes from downtown Tampa to the gateway area of Pinellas, and then to travel on hardened shoulder from gateway to downtown St. Pete. And I'd be really curious if from Secretary Gwynn's perspective, if he's still on, how that might alleviate some additional cost and help us get things done in a quicker, faster way. I know that was a mouthful, but I hope you understand. Yeah, <laughs> kind of get at. Again, I'd like to hear from everyone first, and then maybe we revisit your motion sure. then, and and have Secretary Gwynn make uh, any kind of comments he has on it. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Starkey, you are well, recognized. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear what that looks like. Um, I agree, if 6A gets us moving, then let's get moving. Um, one of the concerns I have with 6A is that I think it gets people who are transportation, maybe, maybe transportation disadvantaged moving, but it doesn't get that other person who the commuter that may um, say, hey, there's a better alternative for me and I, I can you know, work while I'm getting down to downtown Tampa. I don't think it motivates that person enough yet. And that's, that's the kind of um, ridership I'm looking for is to get that kind of group into a, a more advanced, um, you know, different type of transportation mode. So, uh, but for the sake of making sure we're moving forward, I'd like to get something going. And if it's 6A, then it's 6A and we can do something more in the future but I'd be very much like to hear what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am uh, now a fan of 6A. You called it a compromise. I guess that'd be a good word for it, but I like um, Commissioner Starkey's perspective that it's a starting point. Um, I don't see it as an end game, but I do think we need to move something forward. And to me, that seems reasonable as a starting point. Uh, so I would also be in support of that at this time. Thank you, Cliff. And, and I, on behalf of the board too, I wanna thank you. You were not here earlier, but thank you for your considerable help with the, the president of the Senate and seeing that our funding was inserted into the budget. And we appreciate all your efforts on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Flowers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. Um, thank you. Um, I support 6A, but I am, am interested in seeing what the cost variation will be in running it through Pasco County because you won't have as much construction. You should not have as much in construction costs as you do for any other variation. Um, the concern I have with the additional stations, um, the 13, uh, well, having a total of 13 stations, but the majority of those stations 
being in Hillsborough County is um, we've heard quite clearly that Hillsborough County has a different take on how they want to run their transportation. Um, and that would be where the largest part of those stations would be. So I would presume that they would be running their heart transportation in, um, uh, in opposite directions to get people to those stations um, and, and have them take advantage of the service. Um, question, the construction that's occurring right now um, on the Howard Franklin, isn't that construction to include a lane that could be utilized as a express lane? That's my understanding and, and Secretary Gwen can potentially elaborate more on that. Which should help us with the cost because it's already happening. So we shouldn't have to pay for that. I'm sorry. Secretary, did you hear that question? Yeah, so as I understood the question um, it related to the Howard Franklin Bridge and whether we're accommodating this project across the Howard Franklin Bridge. Yeah. So, um, yes, so actually uh, the a combination of the current gateway project and the Howard Franklin project that just got started will provide express lane corridor uh, through there that the um, buses could use. And we also um, are still hopeful that we'll have the funding to build the express lanes all the way down to 375 to downtown St. Pete, not too far after those projects. So essentially we would have from uh, 375 up into the gate, up through the gateway area, up into um, the West Shore area. And then at some point when the West Shore interchange comes in, the express lanes would be brought uh, further. Okay. Um and, and the only other thing I want to say is just to keep in mind that, um, and I know this is just a starting point, we're not making a decision today, but when we are looking at transportation, to keep in mind our partners from other counties who, um, when you look at any of these iterations at this point, they're not benefiting from the project. Right. And um, if we want to continue to have them engaged and, and solidify the rationale for TBARDA's existence, um, partnering with those other counties, you know, we should try to make sure that as we're moving forward, that those um, outliers are included. Absolutely. Or added. So I would go with 6A um, in thought for right now. We're not taking a vote, but I would like to see the dynamics of the numbers to run it coming through Pasco County because you're less apt to have to provide some additional, um, at least shoulder um, pavement construction costs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. Um, again, I'm, I'm in this position I'm always in as the only representative that lives in Hillsborough County and as a countywide county commissioner to critique the plan. I just like to say it sounds like everybody else kind of got briefed on this. I didn't get briefed, so I didn't have any option to look at this ahead of time or get information about this ahead of time. Um, I don't know if that was offered or not, but uh, at any rate, I'll um, go through some critiques I have, and I have to say I don't um, quite have the distinctions down between all of these, but I'll go back to all the things I've been saying. And um, one of them, I'll just ask this question first. There's significant opposition to any additional lanes, and there's proposed uh, 15 foot, two 15 foot lanes on 275. Uh, north of downtown to uh, Fowler or Bears, if that is not done, because that is something that um, may not um, be approved at some point, um, how does that affect this project? I'd just like to hear. Uh, I'd like Scott to answer that, please. Um, so, Commissioner, we, you know, for the dedicated lanes, we were looking at the outside shoulder, which is that 15, 16 foot envelope that uh, in the current TBNX program would be hardened, and then the transit service could use that. Uh, we only need one shoulder. We don't need the inside shoulder, although I think there, you know, uh, the Department of Transportation is typical section. Um, there is a, a shoulder there as well. Um, so if those shoulders weren't present, then obviously we can't do the dedicated lanes and we'd be uh, uh, using exclusively mixed traffic to make that connection to Pasco. Okay. And then how does that affect? Because that is exactly what we're, as we both know, that's exactly what we're talking about that is not, is in, uh, is opposed. So if you needed to be in mix, mixed traffic. 
Yeah, sorry, uh, Commissioner, if you could reiterate your question, I wanna make sure I answer. If those bus on shoulder lanes are not built mm -hmm. because there is significant opposition in Hillsborough County to that from 275 north of downtown to Bears, and therefore this is in mixed traffic, how does it affect this? Uh, those are alternative 6A and 6B, and I, uh, in the earlier slides, I talked about the ridership there. Um, the dedicated lanes do get us more daily riders, uh, and I talked about the growth over time of those dedicated lanes in terms of ridership usage, um, but we do have the numbers there in your board packet of what 6A and 6B would accomplish, and that is mixed traffic north of Tampa all the way to Wesley Chapel. Okay, the other is that um, at one point, I know um, when Commissioner Long talked about uh, hardened shoulders um, just now all the way to Wesley Chapel, but um, what people, what those who do not live here or aren't as familiar with um, some of the traffic patterns here is north of Bears to Wesley Chapel, I-275, where they're talking about putting this, um, there it would be no need for a construction like that, I think David, uh, Secretary Gwen would definitely uh, agree with that. It's like years and years under capacity, um, you know, where there, there's just no need um, to uh, waste taxpayer dollars to put in a hard shoulder north of that. That's why it's, I guess, never been part of the plan. So I just wanted to um, uh, affirm that. Um, I think there would be always significant opposition to the West Chase Station parking garage um, that is planned with a catwalk across to the middle of West Shore. Um, I think that, you know, that is um, for me and I think many people in Hillsborough County would be um, an unused uh, boondoggle. Um, as many have pointed out and as you have pointed out with the graphs, uh, there, there's all this ridership and this planning is about Hillsborough County. Um, there's, you know, what, two stops in um, Pinellas and one stop in Pasco. Everything else is in Hillsborough County and there's significant opposition. You said that this is a compliment but to Hillsborough County, but it's not. It's a duplication, it's a competition with our routes that will already be serving people. So when you talk about your ridership numbers going down, if you don't put in all these stops, it's not because they're not getting places, it's because they're getting places the way they need to on our local routes. Um, and this is really a duplication and a waste of resources and time and not something that in Hillsborough County, uh, the stops are not something that we want. And supposedly they're supposed to be a benefit for us, but it is not, it's a duplication, it's a competition, uh, it's competitive. And it, you would be applying for federal dollars away from the federal dollars that we would get for our local projects that would benefit many more riders. Um, and so that's uh, again, why this is a problem. Um, the express um, service is something that I've thought is fine. We have express service now, and we could have um, better express service from downtown Tampa to uh, downtown St. Pete, as I've said before, with um, just the one, two stops in Pinellas or St. Pete, two stops in Tampa. I think it's just ex exactly right. Um, it, um, if you wanted to do from Pinellas to the or St. Pete to the airport. Again, that's a, a good express service. Um, you've shown that very little of it, um, you know, in terms of stops, you're saying that it's mostly in Hillsborough County. I don't know how much of that is people at the airport maybe wanting to go to downtown Tampa, uh, downtown St. Pete, which would, um, you know, again, talk to an express service doing that. And that wouldn't involve the catwalk um, <laughs> over the, uh, West Shore. Um, and again, you know, the express, I would uh, emphasize again that the express service should be done by the um, the agents, tra transit agencies already in place. Um, that makes the most sense that these transit agencies would be doing as they do now, they're the express service uh, within this. Um, and that would make the most sense for taxpayers. That makes the most sense for um, service that makes the most sense for uh, the um, uh, best program. 
um, that we could have. And finally, so we're, we're looking at all this money to do um, very little to be invested in infrastructure instead of operations, which is what this is about. And yet there's no projections here at all for the cost of operations and where you're gonna get that from because that is, that is the problem that we never talk about. That is uh, what we need to do. And that money, that operational money needs to go to heart and PSTA to do these services. And you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not even sure about the PASCO, uh, but uh, to, to just do these express bus services and provide this um, you know, benefit. But when, when these bus uh, transit agencies are so deeply strapped that they can't even do um, any reasonable local service. And I'll say that um, Pinellas is far better off uh, than we are in Hillsboro. But um, this would be, to me, um, these options are, are terribly, terribly inequitable, hurt heart service, um, that the West Shore catwalk doesn't make any sense. A lot of the, uh, the proposed, um, you know, costs and for the bus on shoulder and what it would um, <laughs> what it would do to take away from local projects that are uh, desperately needed and would serve these individuals. Um, I'll just um, say that I, I'll go back to what <laughs> six stops, um, you know, express buses. You could do it now, but you have to figure out a way to pay for operating. And this capital, I think, is just I don't know, whatever, uh, um, I, it doesn't make any sense. And it certainly doesn't make any sense even with your highest projected um, uh, numbers for ridership, but you only get those because you take away riders or try to from our local heart services. Um, and it does, so it doesn't make any sense to be duplicating in Hillsborough County what heart already does. And to um, use that to gin up your ridership, to do all this funding and then to take, try to um, get you know, Hillsborough County to pay for the majority of the system as well. Commissioner, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I would, in, in order to maybe hopefully reach a consensus and a compromise uh, on this board, are you willing to more formally make a suggestion as, as Commissioner Long wants to do shortly uh, about a substantive program that would be acceptable to you and to Hillsborough County with an eye towards you know, the, the same alignment here, but a scaled down version that, that you could really go along with that would be supplement, truly supplemental in your view to heart and not. Uh, well, and, I think, and I, and I appreciate the uh, comments that uh, actually Commissioner Flowers made recognizing that, but nothing has been done to coordinate at all with heart. Um, and you're at, and I haven't ever even gotten briefed on this till this minute. I mean, I'm seeing this for the first time and just doing my analysis based on the fly here <laughs> from very well intimately knowing this project and looking at these numbers, but having to dig it out over the years. Um, and I find it to be a, a very, very weak project and one that is not, you know, um, valuable for service for to do what we want it to do. But um, if, if you wanted me to do that, I'd appreciate at least like till the next meeting to maybe uh, get more understanding of what this is, um, these proposals, because as I said, I really had no briefing or anything. I, I, I understand that and I completely agree with that. And, and I, I would ask staff to work with Commissioner Kemp and maybe fashioning uh, and, 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 and Scott as well. Uh, Scott, you're raising your hand there. Yeah, you're recognized. Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Holton. And, you know, and I just want to touch on a few of the topics that Commissioner Kent brought up. Um, in terms of the shoulders north of Bears heading into Pasco, there is room there to do the hardened shoulders for a quite efficient uh, capital cost. Um, and I think the goal there is, like Commissioner Starkey mentioned, is, you know, making the service attractive to both folks who rely on transit and those choice riders, some of those commuters, which has always been the mission of the project. 
Um, in terms of the number of stations and the costs associated with stations, especially in Hillsborough County, uh, Commissioner, we've absolutely been listening to you throughout the process. Um, we understand that Hillsborough County is looking at some really great initiatives internally, and we've always wanted this project to be complementary of what Hillsborough County is doing. So really, from my perspective, at least, I, you know, maybe we do just think about Hillsborough County using what's there, not major investments in infrastructure, and just focusing on those key connection points like West Shore at downtown Tampa and USF and allow Hillsborough County to move forward with their projects, which would be, you know, uh, again, we want to complement those efforts. We're certainly never the intention to try to compete with those. Um, and yes, the federal dollars, you know, if we're looking at express bus service, we probably don't have as much options in terms of, of actually seeking those federal dollars. So in that sense, we actually wouldn't be competing with any Hillsborough initiatives. Um, and in the last comment about uh, operations, um, we will absolutely bring that information to you in May, Commissioner. And um, I'd be happy to you know, and, and sit with you and, and over the next month and talk about some options and how we can bring this forward. Thank you. I, would, I, I would add to that too, that I think all of us on this board realize that Hillsborough County is the largest member of this board. We deeply respect that. We also know that the chances of ever getting federal dollars, as I said before, I don't know whether you were on the line at that juncture, are, are slim to none. If Hillsborough is not on board with, with this project, we respect very much that, you know, your potential uh, movement towards rail within the confines of, of Hillsborough County, I think that's uh, a great idea potentially for Hillsborough County. We want to do something that can help all of us in the entire region. And that's what we're here to try to build a consensus, especially around this project. So anything staff can do or the board can do to help you fashion a, a, a potential plan that would be agreeable to all of us as a compromise. I think I speak for most of us that we're willing to listen to that. Because we, um, we- And I would just like to say, uh, uh, just in response, um, to the idea of doing hardened shoulders north of Bears into Wesley Chapel when it's supposed to be um, underutilized road, under capacity for decades to come. Um, and you said there's room there, but just because there's space doesn't mean we lay down pavement and cost taxpayers all kinds of dollars um, when it's totally unnecessary and when a bus can go at any uh, speed there and there's no stops to be made because it's going through wetlands with nothing there. Um, so, it, you know, I don't think we need to, um, again, put costs on that are not um, needed. But secondly, too, I just like to say, um, yes, we are moving forward with rail in Hillsborough County, um, hopefully. Uh, I hope to see that. But as well, there's no reason why it can't be a regional answer. Um, it has, it serves um, uh, Pinellas County in even a greater way. And we, I don't think we ever had honestly a proper presentation on that with any kind of realistic uh, thought. It also serves um, a, as um, Commissioner Mariana pointed out many times when he was on here very well, uh, Pasco County and goes right up to Hernando, right next to where we had a T bar a meeting where I had to cross the tracks in Hillsborough County to get there and cross the tracks in uh, Hernando to get um, to uh, the you know meeting place. Um, so it's not that 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 is actually a more regional uh, than than any of this, which has just been focused on the interstates, but I'll just um, uh, put that out there because there's there uh, are opportunities uh, for that if we ever wanted to do that um, as a region, but I don't think there's ever been um, any um, serious discussion. And it's, it's certainly uh, well, there, a- there were, two, there were two, there was a cost factor that was, was preclusive in the first place because of the cost per individual and ridership mild with rail and uh, regrettably by statute. I don't know if it's regrettable or not, but the, the Florida legislature uh, will not allow us to to move forward with a rail project without their uh, express permission. So that right. is somewhat of a stumbling stone. Uh, uh, again, everyone is open to suggestions and, and presentations. In the context of this meeting, uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything that's palatable to you that you would go along with and, and support. 
uh, that would not be directly competitive with the rail initiative in, in Hillsboro or other, other uh, transit routes uh, utilized. Mm -hmm. Well, and right now this is competitive with, you know, both our, our heart system as well as PSTA actually, but PSTA has far fewer stops um, because I didn't see that it made sense, I guess, uh, or would get them drive them ridership. And so, you know, this is just beefing up ridership numbers at, at um, this, this well, project, but, but I'd be glad to, as, as you suggested, to um, have some conversations um, and get some more information on this from um, Mr. Pringle in the next month and see what. Um, uh, well, I, I will direct our staff here, David and, and, and Scott to coordinate those discussions with you in the hopes of maybe there is a, a viable compromise that we could all reach and fulfill our mission, which is to, to really have regional transit. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Flowers, you're... Not, am I missing that because I, with all due respect, Commissioner Kemp, you keep saying that this is your first time seeing this, but we've had this presentation, this PowerPoint presentation presented to us with the information yes. previously. I'm new to this board and I, you know, not only was it presented to me, but I also took it upon myself to ask questions because I, I wasn't quite clear. So I just wanted to make sure that- There have been presentations, but with, with respect to Commissioner Kemp, I think that if she, she needs additional information- Oh, I don't have a problem with that. It's just that I just want to make sure yeah. that we're all receiving the same yeah. information, which yeah. is, this is not our first time seeing this. Yeah. This has been presented to us and has been made available through the board packet. So even if you didn't attend the meeting, it was available yeah. to you for consideration. Right. The other thing I want to make clear is- I don't think any of us are here to intentionally or purposefully exclude, contradict, or compete. We all have individual transportation projects that are occurring within our own individual counties to supplant uh, transportation modality so that our residents can get to and from as expeditiously as possible for those of us that believe in climate change to help with zero base emissions and all of that. So there are going to be times because we're all looking for funding out of the Department of Transportation, right. whether it's on a state level or federal level. So there are going to be times when some of the things that this body may present as an idea or a suggestion where it comes right up against something that's going on specifically with your county. But we're supposed to be, I thought this body was supposed to be a regional approach to transportation and making things easier for our residents and, and becoming more beneficial to attract businesses to come here, not specifically that it is you know what I want, but it's what is best for all of the people that are represented here. And clearly, you know, if we want to talk about lack of representation, we need to just address Manatee for our dear friend who's not here today, who made a very salient point last meeting that you know, all of this is going on and he's here, but he doesn't have anything to take back to his community that helps him. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what my role that, is here. That is and 100 percent correct. And that's a, a great articulation of our mission statement that we're looking out for everyone here and everyone needs something, basically. 100%. And to, to the point. Commissioner Long, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, there was nothing in my comments when I spoke about the motion that I would like to make that referenced Wesley Chapel or Bears. My comments were pretty much focused on moving regionally citizens from Pasco to downtown Tampa, there to downtown St. Petersburg using the most efficient affordable and, you know, with a sense of urgency to get something done. So to throw stuff in there uh, that is clearly not accurate is just really annoying when we are all working so hard to try to develop a regional solution. And uh, for those of you that, not to switch gears, but if you haven't seen some of the American Rescue Plan Act funding for the St. Pete, Tampa area. There's millions of dollars in there for 
Pinellas County and Hillsborough County. And so, you know, we are making things happen. We do have folks in DC that are paying attention finally to the Tampa Bay area. And I would hope that we can stay focused and, you know, somewhat thoughtful about a regional approach and not just looking at our own backyard because we've done that for over 50 years and it hasn't gotten us very far. So when you're ready for my yeah, motion I'm ready for again, your motion. That you, I'm happy to please, please make it. your motion again and then Thank we can uh, move forward with that. And this is all- Did you have a comment first, uh, Commissioner Stark? Yes, well, I just wanted to say, I, I um, like to go to Florida Tax Watch every now and then and they have a great section on how Florida counties compare. Um, I think the latest one is 2019 data, but um, I, I, I echo comments from Commissioner um, Camp from Hillsborough about lack of funding for transit. Pasco County is 67 out of 67 counties. I think that was our number for funding for, for transit within our county. But I, I think my county still recognizes the value of moving commuters um, through in a, an efficient manner. And also what it could mean um, for regional assets like the airport, um, the port and the sports teams when um, people can utilize an efficient um, means to get there and a safe way to get there. I, I think that's a, a real benefit and a selling point to the Tampa Bay region as we look to, you know, kind of grow up and be one of the big players in the country uh, as, a, as a great destination to move your business to. So I think it's great for economic development. Well said. So, and I was second your motion. Thank um, you. Oh, excuse me. So May I is. just oh. respond for a second? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Please respond, then. Then I'm going to allow Commissioner Long to make her her motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just I wanted to make it. Wanted to uh, restate it for clarity, because obviously. Uh, yeah. Let uh, since since the door was open, let Commissioner Kemp uh, respond, please. Thank you, um, and Commissioner Long. I was not trying to misstate or uh, say uh, put words in your mouth or anything. Um, I think what I heard was that you were talking about a uh, reinforced bus on shoulder from north of downtown 275 to Wesley Chapel. That includes the area I was talking about from Bears to Wesley Chapel, where there's where, where there's <laughs> where there's no, no need for that project. And, and that's what I had asked Mr. Pringle. I'm just clarifying that. Um, I would say that I am a huge transit supporter. I see hugely the economic development needs, um, the uh, equity needs, the, uh, you know, I have, I'm not on this. Um, I, you know, I came on T-BARDA because I really wanted uh, to do everything I could to promote transit in every way. But I have um, been disturbed by the, uh, I think, uh, the lack of what um, this particular project would do to serve everybody in the entire region um, with transit solutions that um, made sense, that were efficient, and did the best to spend our resources. Um, to Commissioner Flowers, I'd just like to say that it's not just federal resources that are brought down for capital, but it's expect expected to be matched by local resources. So this project that is being um, pushed on to Hillsborough County that isn't an efficient use of resources are nonetheless, they would expect us to pay the, the majority of the local match for a project that we don't support here in the county as being a, a efficient and good way to serve transit, as well as the operations cost, um, I think, and taking away operations, it sounds like, to privatize them, because I've never quite heard the answer to this, about why um, it isn't just uh, that we are looking to enhance and strengthen our local uh, bus agencies, which do very well by service, PSTA and HART, uh, by having them do what they do is run these express buses. So I, and I still haven't quite ever gotten an answer for that. We've never um, uh, talked about that. So I think that this would be um, and, and until those answers are, are made, I, you know, I 
don't look at this as being uh, the best thing for robust transit, economic development, unless we come up with a, a better plan. And I think the, the first iterations of this were, uh, were, were not in service to those, those goals that I think we all share. Uh, so um, with that said, I'll just- Thank you for those, um, those comments. You. Uh, Mr. Long, you're now recognized to present your, uh, we to clarify your motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to see, this is my motion. I would like to see projections of ridership, travel time and cost alternatives that do not require the construction of transit lanes in the median of I-275 from downtown Tampa to West Shore. In trying to maximize our leverage of FDOT's investments in this corridor and begin the construction and operation of this project as efficiently and affordably as possible. So the motion specifically is that T. Barter staff and WSP bring back to this board two additional alternatives for our consideration in May. An alternative consisting of bus on hardened shoulder lanes from Pasco County to downtown Tampa, then transitioning to travel in express lanes from downtown Tampa to down Saint, downtown St. Pete. And secondly, an alternative consisting of bus on hardened shoulder lanes from Pasco County to downtown Tampa, then transitioning to travel in express lanes from downtown Tampa to the Gateway area of Pinellas, and then to travel on hardened shoulder from Gateway to downtown St. Pete. That's, that's my motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, second. Wait, Alan has. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Is there any public comment? We have no public comment. Okay, thank and you. And Mr. Chair, may we ask um, our executive director, David Green, what he if, what his recommend, what recommendation might be, given his knowledge of everything we've been talking about? David, you recognize. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we haven't evaluated that uh, either of those alternatives yet, but we're happy to uh, do so over the next month and get with Commissioner Kemp and get her input on those things and, and bring the recommendation back to you all at the May meeting. But I definitely think they're uh, worth looking into. And perhaps maybe get some input from Secretary Gwynn about the cost and the efficiencies from FDOT's perspective as well. Absolutely, happy to. Yeah, okay. Okay, I will call the question. Jennifer, uh, read the roll, please. Who motioned and second? Also, uh, Janet, motion and Catherine. Second. Okay. Jim Holton? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Mayor Kreisman? Yes. Rich McLean? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? No. Commissioner Starkey? Yes. And Commissioner Flowers. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Cliff is. Did you get Cliff? What? <laughs> Sorry. Cliff. Yes. Okay. Seven yeas, motion passes. I have a question. To you recognize. I heard Commissioner Kemp say she. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, well. I heard um, Commissioner Kemp say she was the only one from Hillsboro, but Rich, do you. Oh, okay. Is there a heart represent? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, members, any other questions for for uh, uh, Scott or or Brian or anyone regarding this topic? Obviously, we know our marching orders for for May, and we look forward to uh, the evaluation of uh, Commissioner Long's proposal. Thank you. No questions. Let's go back since Cliff is now here and uh, uh, approve the consent agenda items. Um, do I have a motion for both of those items? Move approval. Okay. Then um, uh, uh, we don't need any public comment on consent agenda, do we now? Uh, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussions? Jennifer, call the roll, please. Tim Holton? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. 
Mayor Kreisman? Yeah. Rich McLean? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? Yes. Commissioner Starkey? Yes. With Manuel? Yes. And Commissioner Flowers? Yes. Okay. Motion does pass. Okay, thanks. We'll now go back to item number D, uh, legislative subcommittee reports, and the chair recognizes both Commissioners Long and Starkey for that report. Commissioner Starkey, do you want to go first? Well, you ran the meeting. Okay. Well, yes, we heard uh, from Ron Pierce, and since I see he's still with us, maybe we can ask him for the latest and greatest from Tallahassee today. Good morning, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, thank you for the opportunity. Live from Tallahassee on day 53, we're um, one week from hopefully the finish line. Um, two updates. Since our last joint meeting, we had a joint finance committee meeting um, and listed a meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lot's changed since then. As I reported then, we were not initially um, not in the House and Senate budget for a $1.5 million appropriation. Um, since then, um, President Wilton Simpson um, has really stepped up for us. Um, thank you. I know we said this earlier in the committee meeting. I'll say it again now. Cliff Manuel has been a big part of that. So thank you, Cliff, for, for helping with that. Um, the Senate did a floor amendment on uh, when the budget was being heard in the Senate for $1.5 million in non-recurring transportation trust funds. Those dollars were included in the Senate budget. The House and Senate started budget conference um, late last week. And um, those dollars, I'm happy to report to you, have been closed out and um, have been agreed to by the House and Senate. Um, House and Senate are probably um, just over halfway through the budget conference process. They had a big pass this morning on health and human services. So we'll see if that's approved. If so, they're getting pretty close to the finish line and getting, a, I think, a budget approved. So um, once it is approved and it goes to the member's desk, um, once they get to the conference process next Tuesday, hopefully the uh, House and Senate will vote on the final product um, on Friday, April the 30th, which again should be the last day of session. We will then start working on a veto strategy with the governor's office. Um, last year we were vetoed for, I, I think for a number of reasons, you know, obviously we're in the midst of at the beginning of COVID at that point in time. And also um, we also had to receive federal dollars. We've made it very clear to the house and Senate. We'll make it also the governor's office that a lot of the federal dollars that are coming down to Florida at this point in time, t bart is not going to qualify for directly. And so these state funds are, are critically important. So but again, thank you to um, President Simpson and, and again, Cliff, thank you for your, for your help there. Um, good news on our, um, our local, our, our bill as well that we filed relating to our Enabling Act. Um, the bills themselves are not gonna make it to the finish line as I reported two weeks ago, but the good news is um, thank you to um, Chairman Angolia, Blaze Angolia in the House. We were included as a part of the House DOT transportation package. The Senate included us yesterday in their version of that package. Thank you to Senator Roussan and, um, um, and Senator Hooper. So it's nice having some um, you know, members from the Tampa Bay area in, in key leadership positions. So um, the House and Senate have not agreed to the final DOT package, but being in both packages at this point in time, um, that's a really, really good sign. So, um, so at this point in time, I'm happy to report number one, the 1.5 million in non-recurring transportation trust funds have been approved by the House and Senate, number one, and number two, that are our changes to the Enabling Act that you all um, asked us to do um, is moving forward in the House and Senate and hopefully we'll have a good news report next week. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from anyone on the committee? No? Okay, so I don't know if Harry is still on. Harry, are you still with us? Yes, ma'am, Steve's also on. Oh, great. Hi, Steve, we missed you this morning. Thank you. Sorry, I had a doctor's appointment. That's okay. Um, Harry covered for you. Don't you worry. So, Harry, do you want to give us an overview of our federal program and all the things going on in Washington? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, and Commissioners. We, we talked at the Legislative Committee meeting about, I think, four specific areas. We Obviously, there's quite a bit of focus right now on infrastructure uh, package that the President has proposed. He, he proposed at the end of March, a $2.25 trillion infrastructure package that provides for roads, bridges, highways, um, public transit ports, airports, a whole variety of, of typical, your usual infrastructure, plus some additional things. Uh, he's been trying to encourage Republicans to engage in the, in the process here. 
and the Republicans this week, Senate Republicans released a smaller infrastructure package of about $568 billion. Uh, it, the Republican package was spread out over five years. The president's package is spread out over eight years. Um, and the Republican package focuses more on the traditional infrastructure, roads, highways, bridges, and, and uh, public transit and airports, among others. And so uh, that really kicks off the debate. The House is trying to expedite passage of an infrastructure bill. The Speaker wants something done before the 4th of July. The House Transportation Committee is supposed to try and take up a bill sometime next month. Um, and Steve has always talked about this in our previous discussions. The real trick is how to pay for this. Uh, the Republican proposal uh, would provide some user fees, uh, airport user fees, port user fees. They're exploring the idea that uh, uh, miles driven as a, as a new way to collect some revenue to capture some of the electric vehicles that are being used. Uh, and they also look to recapture some of the unused uh, COVID relief funding that's been provided by Congress over the last year. So that's the way they would pay for theirs. The, the president would pay for his infrastructure package by raising the federal corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. So that's a major um, dividing line between the Republicans and Democrats. So we'll remain to see what happens. Uh, the good news is if there is an infrastructure bill, it'll, it'll provide significantly more money for transportation and public transit projects, which obviously um, provide op future opportunities for, uh, for T-BARTA projects. Uh, second thing we talked about this morning was um, uh, the nominations. Uh, as just prior to our last meeting, uh, Secretary of Transportation had been confirmed. Since then, uh, the Senate has confirmed uh, Polly Trottenberg to be the Deputy Secretary of Defense. She's a a uh, real transit expert having worked as the uh, uh, commissioner for the New York City Department of Transportation. She served in a senior transportation position under President Obama. And so she's a well-known uh, well quantity and will do a great job. Uh, and since we last spoke, uh, the president's also formally nominated uh, Nuria Fernandez to be the administrator of the Federal Transit Administration. She also is uh, well-versed in transit issues, having uh, previously served as general manager for the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. She also served in similar capacities with the New York Metro, as well as Chicago Transit Authority and the Washington Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And she was an acting FTA administrator under Bill Clinton back in the, in the 90s. So she's got a, a good record on transit. Uh, the third issue we talked about, uh, Chair, Ms. Madam Chair, this morning was uh, the administration released its notice of funding opportunity this month for the raise, what they call the raise grant program. This is the follow on to what used to be called the tiger grant program and then the build grant program. The raise grant program has been renamed by the Biden administration. It stands for the rebuilding American infrastructure and sustainability and equity program. This is a $1 billion funding opportunity for um, regionally significant transportation projects. Uh, we had a little bit of a discussion this morning about uh, whether T-BART is ready to apply for that or not and, and don't really have a, a project in the pipeline yet. But again, it is, it's an annual competition for a billion dollars. It's a very competitive program. Uh, the program over its history is awarded $9 billion uh, over spread over 680 projects out of a total of 9,700 applications. So the rate of success is about 7%. So that tells you how competitive it is. And the key to success in this program is to have, as I said, regional projects that are supported within the region. So being that T-BARDA is a regional transit authority, this would you know, ultimately someday potentially be a good source of funding for, for a project that you're looking at. What's significant about this uh, notice of funding opportunity is it's one of the first major funding opportunities that the administration has put out where we can kind of see what the new administration's priorities are. Um, it, it says in their notice of funding opportunity that raised funding will be evaluated based on merit criteria that include safety, environmental sustainability, quality of life, economic competitiveness, state of good repair, innovation, and partnerships. So that's, that's kind of been traditionally what they've looked for. But the new criteria they add are projects that demonstrate improvements to racial equity, reduce impacts of climate change, and create good paying jobs. So you know, something to think about if, if this is something that T. Barter decides to pursue. Um, you know, there, there are some new criteria to focus on. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that the president on April 9th 
released uh, what they call his skinny budget, which is kind of the broad outline of his federal budget with much more detail to follow uh, in May for each of the agencies. But in his general overview, it's good news for transportation as he's requesting $25.6 billion in discretionary funding for the Department of Transportation for the next fiscal year. And that provides $3.2 billion in additional funding, which is about a 14% increase over the current year. So that's good news. And he focuses in part on expanding access to high quality transit. He includes, includes $2.5 billion for the Capital Investment Grant Program, which is a really important program for transit agencies. Uh, Commissioner Long knows that uh, the Sunrunner Program BRT project in, in uh, St. Petersburg is the result of uh, a CIG grant. So this is a 23% increase over the current fiscal year uh, funding level for the CIG program. So that's, that's good news for transit authorities. He in, recommends in his budget uh, $250 million for low and no emission bus program, which is more than doubles the pro current program. So that's also good news for local transit authorities. He creates a new program called the Thriving Communities Initiative Pilot Program. $110 million program to provide grants and technical assistance to communities to improve access to destinations and, and foster community vibrancy. Uh, another program that uh, might potentially be something for T-Bar to look at in the future. And then lastly, he, he, he's been talking quite a bit about a program that he's funding, it recommends funding at $20 billion um, to support communities um, that have been isolated or damaged by previous transportation projects. He talks uh, quite a bit about New Orleans and Syracuse, where they built interstate highways through the city and had to raise a number of homes and businesses to do that. And it's kind of divided those cities. But you know, there are projects I'm sure you can think of in the local area where road, major roadways have gone through communities and it has created problems. So there's a program there to try and reconnect those communities. Uh, again, something else that might be good for Tibarta and Erie to look at. So the with the release of his budget, when the details come in May, that'll kick off the appropriations process about three months late this year. But the House leadership at least uh, is committed to try and get the bills done and try and get in by the end of the summer and try and get some bills signed into law before the f new fiscal year begins on October 1st. So it's gonna be a, a busy couple months here uh, related to transportation and we will continue to keep you advised and are happy to answer Steve. I don't know if I left anything out, Steve, and, if not, we're happy to answer any questions. No, if I can say, Commissioner, very quickly, Harry did a great job of summarizing all the different initiatives. But to kind of summarize, there are, you know, we've talked about infrastructure for many years. They're finally, Congress and the White House are finally spending time to invest their energies into it. And you're really going to see three different funding tracks happening this year on infrastructure. There'll be an infrastructure bill. We don't know what it's, how big it's going to be yet. There's between 2.25 trillion and 568 billion, the Senate Republican proposal. We know there's gonna be a surface transportation bill and P Chairman Peter DeFazio in the house is very strong on increasing funding for buses and zero emission buses at that. And then finally, as Harry just mentioned, the annual appropriations bill with these new initiatives for transit. So it's a very, uh, it's a very exciting time for transit and it's a very, uh, a lot of opportunities I think for T-BARDA to, to look forward to funding down the road. Excellent. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from the committee? Anybody? No? Okay. Then. So I conclude your report on yeah, legislative. It okay. does. Thank You're you very much. Continued to be recognized for the finance committee. Well, the best thing about the finance committee when we met is we actually have money in the bank. So that's very exciting. And, um, all the bills are paid. So we're making progress, that's for sure. Uh, as it relates to, we, we did have two presentations and Diane, are you still on the, are you still with us? Do you wanna talk about the commuter van pool contract? Did she not, she went away? Okay, well. We good morning. Oh, he's there. Oh, she can give us some reason. Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so what you have, what we have before us this morning, we have the commuter van pool services um, amendment. It is a one-year amendment 
to um, continue to sponsor the Van Poo program. Uh, initially, this contract was executed back in 2018 for a two-year term, and it carried with it uh, three one-year renewals. This will be the second renewal, and it will start July 1st, 2021, and go through June 30th, 2022. The amount of funds that's dedicated to this project is $400 a month and staff has been satisfied with the results thus far, and we would like to continue. So therefore we are asking for approval of this amendment for the Van Poole program. Jenna, can you make a motion for approval? Yes, so I move that we approve this $400 a month. We have the money in the banks. Any public comment? Oh. Okay, well, it's in the agreement, right? Approving the agreement, renewing the agreement. Been moved and seconded. On been a motion and second. I think we have to get any public comment. Public comment, no public comment. Yes, okay, on each vote, you have to have public comment. So appreciate that, Council. Thank you for that. Been a motion and second. Uh, is there any further discussion on the motion? None being heard, it Jennifer. The mayor has, okay. Well, that being said, why don't we take a five minute recess then? Oh, Anyone else ask? Can we do any more business? You know, we, we we need to try and limit member comments to. Yeah. That that's been a problem. And We got a couple more votes. Here's the restroom real quick. <laughs> At least that was a, a good welcoming back, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Never been welcome back to the restroom so great before. <laughs> so we had a motion and a second. We're just waiting to. For the uh, continuation of the mm. Okay. Are we are we going to make it through all of this? Because I I I probably. Uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. It's twelve. Um, just for information only, right. or are you going to talk about all that stuff? Informational. That's just including the package. Review. Yep. Yep. We were back. The mayor, the mayor was prompt. No, <laughs> okay, for to, never been so to, to strictly comply with the you know rules of order, please call the roll again to make sure we have the quorum present. Here. Cliff Manuel. Here. Commissioner Long. Here. Mayor Kreisman. Here. Rich McLean. Here. Commissioner Kemp. Commissioner Starkey. Oh no. Here. And Commissioner Flowers. Here. Did we lose a quorum? Cliff is here, so I can. Cliff. I, I call him Cliff. Do we have a quorum? We sure do. Yes. Okay, there was a motion and a second to approve the extension of the commuter van pool services contract agreement. Uh, is there any further discussion? You got a question there? Sorry. Blinking there. Yep, just ready to start. Okay, uh, Jennifer, uh, call the roll, please. Okay. Jen Holton? Yes. Cliff Manuel? Yes. 
Commissioner Long? Yes. Mayor Kreisman? Yes. Rich McLean? Yes. Commissioner Starkey? Yes. And Commissioner Flowers? Yes. Okay, motion does pass seven to zero. Okay, thanks. And I think, Janet, there's one more motion you would yes, like to so make regarding the gondola feasibility. I yeah, think. Brian, do you want to come back in and give us an update on the on the feasibility study, please? Quick inference. Thank you. Uh, so the committee approved the motion to recommend that the board authorize the executive director to execute a one-year contract with SCJ Alliance, not to exceed $779,271 for the Pinellas Aerial Gonda Feasibility Study. At the August 2020 meeting, the board had directed staff to work with Ford Pinellas in putting together a scope of work for a gondola study. We did that. We put together a scope of work that would look at two potential corridors, one in St. Pete that would look at connecting the area around Tropicana Field with the St. Pete Pier, and a second one in Clearwater that would connect downtown Clearwater uh, with Clearwater Beach. In February, we posted, <clears throat> excuse me, a request for qualifications. Four consulting firms responded to it. A committee composed of one staff person each from T-Barda, Ford Pinellas, the city of St. Pete, and the city of Clearwater reviewed the proposals. SCJ Alliance came out on top. We were very impressed with their proposal. Stephen Dale, the project manager, has 15 years of experience in the field of aerial gondolas, um, and he's personally managed over 20 gondola feasibility studies. Mm. The funds for the study would come out of the Innovative Transit Solutions Public Transportation Grant that we received from the state. And so. Thank you, Janet. Would you like to make a motion to accept that? Uh, I move that we forward, accept move forward the, for the study. Second. Then a motion, a second. Uh, is there any public comment? Any public comment? There, there is no public comment. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Jennifer, please call the roll. Jim Holson? Yes. Cliff Manuel? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Mayor Kreisman? Yes. Rich McLean? Yes. Commissioner Starkey? Yes. And Commissioner Flowers? Yes. Okay. Motion does pass. Thank you. Uh, Chad, any further comments from finance? No, that's the end of the report. Thank, Thank you for that report. Glad we moved it uh, forward quickly. Uh, uh, Rich McLean, you're recognized for the policy committee report. Thank you, Chair, and I'll make this quick. Uh, we touched on two topics during the policy committee meeting. One of them uh, was information only, and that was the transit and telework survey results. Um, for those who haven't seen the briefing, I would recommend that you take some time. It's a quick read, uh, but, but very enlightening. Um, not only did it touch on, of course, on telework and, and the survey regarding that, but it also <clears throat> highlighted regional transit and the regional transit needs that our constituents or our members of our communities are looking for. I think those results were very telling in terms of regional transit um, and the desires to have regional transit both uh, increased and enhanced. So um, if you can, please take some time to go through that. Like I said, it's a quick read, probably about three or four minutes and you can get to the gist of it. The second one, I'm going to call Brian uh, Pizarro back up. It's a public transportation agency safety plan update. I think you'll find this plan very minor, but we do have to have board approval to move forward. With it. Yes. Um, for you, an action item recommend that the board approve the 2020 2021 <laughs> update to TBARDA's public transportation agency safety plan or PTASP. Uh, we adopted our initial safety plan last July. FDA requires that we update it and adopt it annually. Uh, the purpose of the PTAS is basically just to ensure that transit agencies are actively looking at safety in all parts of their operation, whether out on the road or in the office. t we're a very small agency. Our safety plan is pretty straightforward. We have a safety committee that meets quarterly. It includes our partners from commute, um, commute Enterprise. We mostly we discuss whether there were any van pool accidents, what was the cause of, of the accident, was there anything that could have been done to prevent it. Uh, the changes that we made to the plan are really very minor. We added a table. We we're basically updated the performance metrics table for the van pool program to include 2020 data. And we changed references in the plan from director of commuter services to manager of commuter services. And that was the only two changes. And that was it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I'll accept a motion to approve that. Motion to approve. Oh, so move. Second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, is there any public comment?
There is there is no public comment. Is there any further discussion, members? Okay, none being heard. Jennifer, call the roll, please. Jim Holton. Yes. Cliff Manuel. Yes. Commissioner Long. Yes. Mayor Kreisman. Yes. Rich McLean. Yes. Commissioner Starkey. Yes. And Commissioner Flowers. Yes. Okay. Motion does pass. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rich, anything further? Uh, policy committee. Just one comment I, I failed to mention on the transit and telework survey results, uh, which was done by Chris Jadick. Uh, I did ask uh, that be forward to all transit agencies that are our partners. So that's out there. Thank you. Uh, on the uh, chairman's report, uh, uh, two comments. Uh, again, I want to thank Cliff for his help in uh, securing funding from the Senate. Appreciate all your hard work on that. And uh, and are, are very grateful for that. Um, and, and, and hopefully this uh, appropriations will survive our uh, you know, government or uh, governor's veto. Uh, I know our lobbyists are working on that, but you know, we never know in today's uh, world. Um, my next comment is, is my sincere hope that we can build consensus on this board. Um, as much agreement as there is, there's still some differences of opinion, obviously with our with our sister county, Hillsborough County. Uh, from here, many of us live there, have lived there before. I've been a resident of both Hillsborough and Pinellas County. Uh, I hate to see division. There's always gonna be some, but the purpose of this agency is to promote regional transportation. It is not about Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, Manatee County, or Pasco County. It's about what we can do regionally and politics is the art of the possible, unfortunately. So it is my hope that with Commissioner Long's uh, modified proposal and perhaps one coming from Commissioner Kemp, that we can all get together, roll up our sleeves and come to some con con consensus that we can then go as a unified voice to Tallahassee and to Washington, D.C. and say, we need to do this maybe as a first step, as a first start, but that will open the door to much, much more in the future. So. I would ask all, all members to work towards that end with, with your respective communities and constituents and, and stakeholders to try to make that happen. And, and it's my sincere hope that Hillsborough County and, and the city of Tampa will be on board you know, with that uh, process as well. So that said, I will now recognize uh, David for his uh, executive director's report. Uh, this was an effort between T Barta and Commute Connector to raise awareness of transportation options that are available to businesses and their employees that reduce traffic congestion and protect our environment. Commute Connector is uh, FDOT District 1's Commuter Assistance Program Administrator. The event was held at the County Courthouse Public Square and MCAT, the Sarasota Manatee MPO, Cutter and Enterprise also participated and provided information to those who attended. Uh, we contacted over 80 Manatee businesses uh, with invitations to the event and uh, had a really good turnout. Bicycling and learning about nearby bike routes were the greatest areas of interest. And uh, many people asked about the possibility of a regional train or bus line that would connect Manatee to TPA quickly and efficiently. Secondly, I want to mention that uh, Melanie has been working really hard with CLA on our fiscal year 2020 audit. Uh, you may recall that we have no June uh, board meeting, so we want to be sure the audit is complete and ready to pre present to you all next month. Uh, next, I want to mention that we are working with USERV on the next grant application for TD Tampa Bay. Uh, we originally presented the program as a three-year pilot, but the initial round of funding uh, only covers it through June 30th. CPD's application window closes on May 3rd, but we anticipate having the application submitted early. Uh, one enhancement that we're considering is expanding access south to Sarasota. Uh, we received some feedback from Manatee residents that uh, they're more inclined to travel south than north. So we're evaluating the possibility of folding that travel market into the program. Uh, we have completed the mid-year performance report for year one and we'll present the results of that during next month's policy committee meeting. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna point out that we uh, added some staff reports to the board packet. These are for informational purposes only and require no board action. 
Uh, we just wanted to provide more information to you and give you a better look at some of the activities that we are uh, routinely involved in. And these will be included in each board packet moving forward. Uh, the meeting next month is on May 21st uh, and will again be here at PSTA. Uh, we have no new future meeting topics. Uh, and uh, item number nine on the agenda is a presentation from Lilium with an update on their air taxi program. However, um, Will Nicholas is unable to join us this morning, so we will not be able to, to provide that presentation for okay. you. Okay, is that gonna be rescheduled or are we to be uh, determined? We will uh, work with Lilium on their ability to reschedule that, yes. Okay, one, one uh, final question I had on the committee, committee vacancies. Can you just briefly go over those for the benefit of the members uh, if there's some committee uh, vacancies available? I believe, I don't have it in front of me. I'm um, not sure if Jennifer does, but I believe the, the committee vacancies are on our Citizens Advisory Committee. Okay. Four vacancies, uh, one in Manatee, one from the city of Tampa, um, and I'm going by memory. I don't recall. And those, those need appointments by us or? Uh... Uh, with the the board members who represent those particular right. areas. Um, so we, we reach out to board members to, to try to accommodate everybody with an appointee um, on our CAC. So we're, we're continuously working to fill those vacancies. I just wanted to make sure that process was in the works with the appropriate- it, It's continuous. Okay. We, we always uh, reach out to board members to, to try to fill vacancies. Okay, good. Any, any other questions for David? I filled mine. Okay, none, none being heard. Is there any new business to come before the good of the order? Left to recognize. Um, when I listened to Commissioner Kemp talk, of course, I'm just a fellow from up in Hernando way. Um, she talks about this huge public opposition to federal dollars improving transit systems in Hillsborough County. Does that huge opposition exist? I mean, I mean, I. I mean, I read and I'm in the papers and, you know, I try to keep my ear to the ground, but I don't hear the ground swell against um, federally funded dollars being used to improve transit in any of our counties. So, Well, our, our data earlier suggested, I, I believe it might have been before you got in, uh, that the public overwhelmingly is clamoring for public transit. And there is an excellent... Especially when you can bring in federal dollars and you have DOT cooperating, it just seems like such a thing to be blessed with. Um, so I was just curious, y'all are, I, I don't live in Hillsboro. Um, I do come up here from time to time. In fact, I'm having dinner here tonight with my daughter. Um, but um, I just don't hear it. So I was curious if it's just something I miss, you know, that I'm missing or does it get as far north as Hernando? Uh, and if it was something y'all were concerned about as far as putting something forward that the public might actually be, uh, you know, really strongly against. And I guess y'all aren't hearing. I haven't heard it either. I don't know, speak for anyone else. I, I, I desperate I need. I on another board with a colleague from Hillsborough who expressed exactly the opposite. So, you know, like everything else in life, it's always a small group of people with the loudest, angriest voices that usually somehow get people's attention, but doesn't necessarily represent the entire county. Well, I know as elected officials, y'all have to keep your ear to ground more than I do, but um, you never want to be working hard to accomplish something that the public doesn't want. So I'm just assuming the public does want improved transit systems, and of course they should be in cooperation with PSTA and Hart, but I, I was just curious, you know, well, I, was, I was listening and she said several times, huge public opposition. I was trying to figure out exactly where that was coming from. To the contrary, every citizen that I've talked to has asked for more. And I know a lot of the, 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 the younger people that are at the university and so forth will want options where they don't have to ever buy a car. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think it's incumbent on us to give them those options. I formerly lived on Harbor Island and the biggest issue out there with all the work that uh, Mr. Vinnick is doing and Channel Side and all that is the, is the desperate need for more public transit options to get people around. So, you know, when the governor um, canceled the federal money for the train, mm -hmm. 
My son said he was uh, working in downtown Tampa. He was very active with downtown partnership. He brought that psych cyclo something to downtown and the, all the concerts down in Curtis Hickson Park. He, he was really making a difference in, in downtown Tampa. He was president of the ULI, the youth group uh, in the ULI. And my son said, I'm out of here. And he went to MIT, went to Boston, got his master's in real estate, and went to New York and now Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, and didn't have a car for a long time. He sold his car. He was very happy to, but it was very hard for him to take his golf clubs. Oh. <laughs> right. So, he now has a car. We have the greatest community in the area, and I, I love the, you know, the, 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 the water taxi and the ferry over to Tampa and so forth. There's nothing better to get people around and also have a fun experience. So, yeah. this is where our, our money needs to be to go. Yeah. Well, he, I, I keep trying to get his company to do more around here. He did try and participate. They did in, in Midtown, but they weren't a right fit. But they're, they're looking at projects around here. I'm still trying to get it back. The taxes, you know, that's my little hook. Well, <laughs> well I'll sleep better tonight knowing that uh, my support for the transit systems, the federal dollars, and the hardened lanes is not going to upset too many people down here. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, if, you can, if you can do for the whole region with the feds, which you did for T. Barda with the Florida <laughs> Senate, then maybe uh, you need to, to get up there and, and hang out with Harry more. And uh, we got some friends up there, too. They probably see Florida in the same light. Um, Mr. Chairman, Cliff, I don't know if you were able to hear our discussion about um, starting the um, framework for a regional transportation summit. Um, we had kind of talked about it before, bringing a lot of people together to talk about transportation. So we got a lot more voices heard. And I think, um, you know, we have a lot to talk about. We've got the uh, trolleys, we've got Lilium, we have, you know, what might be a regional bus system and maybe one day rail. But I think, I think it's really good to bring, bring a regional transportation summit back um, to the area. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Last time we had one was at the Tampa International Airport. It was packed. Yeah, that was just too packed. Small. And we had it in Hillsboro. Yeah. So. Have it there again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Great. I'm I'm having lunch with Joe Lapano in a week, so I'll put that on his radar. I remember Joe speaking there about the uh, air taxis. Mm -hmm. He's a visionary. Did a lot of things people couldn't do. Amen. In a pretty short period of time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just My pleasure. Any any further comments? Mr. Chairman, I see Secretary Gwynn has his hand raised. Secretary Gwynn, you're recognized. Hello. Yeah, just real quick. And I, I heard a few questions about concerning the opposition for um, the widening in um, Hillsborough County. So this goes back to, um, in the most part, if you remember, at one time we had express lanes going north of I-4, but through our SEIS, we decided not to do that. And the only improvements could be to add an additional general purpose lane in each direction within the existing right of way um, up to Bears. Um, that's not currently funded. Um, at the time, we did receive um, a significant amount of opposition from people that I'd say live within, say, a half mile of, of the roadway there. Um, however, when we looked regionally, there was a lot more support because obviously a lot of people who don't live within a, a quarter, half mile of the, of the facility also see it as, as a resource. But that was also part of that same discussion regarding um, taking the current I-275 north of I-4, um, more or less raising it and creating a boulevard. And so I think that's where the discussion in terms of opposing any improvement within the existing um, uh, right-of-way came up. But, um, it's just been a long-standing um, discussion. If you look at it regionally, there seems to be support for widening it. If you look very locally at the area in, in that general vicinity of that road, you see opposition. So, and that's not unusual for regional projects, but I just thought I'd add that as to answer that question. Yeah, wait a second, wait, wait. Uh, yes, yes, Commissioner Kemp, yes. Yes, I just like to, um, and, and thanks, Secretary Gwen, for uh, outlining that. But I, I it, it does go right through that. It cuts right through the urban area of the city and has, as um, you know, has 
terrible effects uh, by adding 30 feet more of roadway uh, to that, which is this discussion for a system that doesn't make any sense as far as it, it won't be serving the neighborhood and it won't be serving the area. And that area, 60% of the ridership on uh, that expressway between downtown and Bears is local ridership and they're significantly opposed to any of it. It's not the regional ridership. So of course the region doesn't care about the impacts they have, but as we know, there are significant impacts that come, especially in air pollution. And we are one of the most affected areas in the entire state by bad air, by particulate matter, by uh, childhood asthma and asthma. And they've shown the um, watershed reports um, more recently that connected to asthma, cardiovascular disease, um, perhaps cancer and dementia has serious, serious impacts. Um, and there is, uh, it also has hurt the grid in the area. So I wouldn't tie it just to um, anything like uh, taking it down to put a, um, a boulevard in there, but significant and serious opposition to a widening of 30 feet um, from downtown, two lanes, 15 feet each from downtown to bears. And I, I think that there is very, very significant opposition. Of course, um, it has barely made the tip, but was opposed by a majority of the county commission um, that are on the MPO. Um, so, you know, I think that there, there is very significant opposition that extends outside of the, the neighborhood. We appreciate the comments and, and, and uh, duly noted. And we're, we're just at our time now. So I think it's probably time to wrap up everyone. Thanks everyone for participating. If there's no further comments, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Oh.